good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the uh, therapeutic update lecture series, which is organized by the uh, Sri Lankan Association, uh, the Medicinal Drugs Committee. <clears throat> so today uh, we are uh, we have organized a very important topic to uh, discuss, which is on COVID nineteen. Uh, I'm happy to see that you know already by twelve o'clock, uh, you know we have over hundred participants joining. Uh, so the, we have organized uh, two presentations uh, for today's event. Uh, one is on COVID-19 management and the other one is on COVID-19 vaccines, two currently very important topics. And it is my pleasure as the chairperson of the uh, Medicinal Drugs Committee of the SLMA uh, to invite the first speaker, um, uh, Dr. Harsha Satish Chandra. He does not need any, um, uh, any uh, you know, uh, introduction to the audience. He is a consultant physician at the National Hospital of uh, Sri Lanka, and he has been managing uh, COVID-19 patients uh, uh, who are admitted to the hospital. Uh, so, and also been involved in developing uh, guidelines as well. So, it is my pleasure to invite Dr. Harsha, Harsha Satish Chandra, uh, consultant physician, to uh, start the uh, uh, the meeting uh, with his presentation on uh, management of COVID-19. Over to you, Harsha. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Pidashi. I must thank uh, Professor, Professor Pidashi Kalapati, Chairperson, Medicinal and Drugs Committee of the SLMA, uh, and uh, the, the Medicinal and Drugs Committee as well, for inviting me to uh, give this uh, talk on uh, one important aspect of COVID-19. Uh, let me start sharing my slides. Are we all right? Yes, yeah, we can start. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So today, I think uh, this is a timely topic, and uh, we are going to discuss two aspects uh, that are important for the mitigation measures to combat COVID-19. Uh, later on, Prof. Nilika will be talking on vaccines, and I will try to deal with uh, this topic of therapeutic update on COVID-19. Uh, now, uh, since the uh, release of the SARS uh, coronavirus 2 genomic sequence by China way back uh, on the 10th of January 2020, uh, the scientific community world over has been uh, trying uh, various therapeutic and uh, vaccine targets. And uh, there were lots of antivirals which were used in previous viral infections, particularly influenza, and they were tried out, but the initial trials were quite disappointing. And uh, uh, some of the drugs that also had antiviral properties were, were used in these trials uh, based on evidence of in vitro efficacy. And uh, I think uh, you must be aware of uh, quite a few drugs being uh, repositioned or, uh, uh, and uh, uh, re, uh, say, uh, if you take drugs like uh, hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin, uh, they have been uh, repositioned to treat uh, COVID-19. Uh, but one aspect that was uh, quite uh, evident was that the initial trials were quite uh, uh, quite disorganized and actually they did not yield very uh, sound evidence and that was a major drawback in the early phase of the pandemic to make decisions but subsequently I think the quality of the trials improved and now we have more evidence for certain uh, measures. Now, just to refresh our memory on what COVID-19, severe COVID-19 is, it's essentially the main component is a pneumonia, but it does not stop there. It is a, almost like a multi-system disease. And uh, uh, we know uh, in patients with severe COVID-19, one major aspect is ARDS, uh, and, they, and the patients need prolonged, me prolonged mechanical ventilation. And in fact, if you compare with patients uh, with severe influenza, uh, the need and, and uh, the uh, length of uh, ventilation uh, is about a week longer in patients with uh, COVID-19. Your microphone is on. Microphone. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, you can yeah. be, uh, you have well heard. Yeah, okay, thank you. yes, right, right. Um, and uh, uh, another aspect is that the, uh, the infection could lead to severe viremia. Uh, and uh, here the uh, issue is that the virus attacks the uh, organ cells directly. And in fact, the virus has been identified from even the myocardium and it can have effects on the kidney. And then there is this uh, much talked about uh, 
phenomenon of the cytokine storm, where a dysregulated immune system uh, is evident and it causes lots of manifestations. And uh, uh, that's one major aspect. Uh, then, of course, we do know about the, all the thrombotic complications, acute myocardial infarction, acute stroke, uh, deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism. Thrombotic complications are said to arise on a background of severe inflammation. And then, of course, the well-known issues of secondary bacterial and fungal sepsis. Uh, so a multitude of effects uh, could be caused by COVID-19. And of course, uh, there can be multi-organ failure and death. So the issue here is that the patient population is quite heterogeneous and no two patients with COVID-19 are alike. So that itself is a huge challenge because we have to tailor our treatment to the individual patient. So that is one major issue that we face in uh, refining our treatment for COVID-19. So from this slide stems the therapeutic targets that we could uh, think of uh, in managing these patients. So innovative oxygenation and ventilatory strategies with precise time, that's important, the time uh, during which you use these strategies. Then of course, antivirals targeting specific therapeutic windows, immunosuppressive agents to counter cytokine storm. And of course, we saw uh, what role thrombosis plays, so anticoagulants. And then in the initial phase of the illness, two aspects, convalescent plasma and synthetically derived monoclonal antibodies, which would try to retard the progression of the illness. And of course, appropriate antibiotics and antifungals and antiplatelets when indicated. And uh, the emphasis is mainly on good supportive care in the HDU and the ICU. So getting on to the various aspects of, uh, aspects of uh, therapeutic agents, one uh, major uh, drug that was uh, used in the early phase of the illness and even now is IV remdesivir. Now, this is a drug that interferes with the viral replication and uh, it was used for COVID-19 on the basis that there was very uh, good in vitro efficacy demonstrated. It was used, with, used in Ebola as well, uh, but uh, it was not that successful. So there have been a multitude of trials with varying results, and uh, it's mostly used in hospitalized hypoxic patients. Uh, and uh, there are several dose regimens. A common dose regimen is that uh, a 200 milligram IV dose is given on day one, and that's followed by 100 milligram daily for up to five to 10, five to 10 days. So generally, now uh, it is the five-day course, which is widely practiced in countries where it is used. Now, um, there have been limited studies, although it's an antiviral, there have been limited studies in the early part of the disease, because one can postulate that if an antiviral is to work well, it has to be given early on in the illness. But uh, uh, disappointingly, there have been many trials done uh, where it is used uh, in the early part of the illness. Uh, it's used more in the US, less in the UK and the EU. And the interest came about through this uh, landmark trial, which was published in the, published in the NEJM. Uh, it was an RCT conducted by the National Institute of Health. Uh, the trial was labeled ACTT1. And I think you may have seen this publication which uh, came out of the trial. And there they come. Uh, they compared uh, remdesivir, uh, IV remdesivir with standard care. But strangely, the outcome measure that they checked was hospital was uh, the length of hospital stay. It was not a mortality study, which was quite strange. I am I, I, I'm not sure whether you can see the details of the slides, but I think you will be able to appreciate that. Uh, there are the there is a breakdown where they have compared remdesivir in patients uh, in the overall population, and then in patients on oxygen, patients on without oxygen, patients receiving invasive mechanical ventilation. In the initial, uh, uh, in, the, in the first left top slide, you could see that in uh, what they have measured is uh, the proportion recovered on a given day. So let's, uh, if you take remdesivir is in blue and placebo is in red, 
So in patients with, uh, uh, when remdesivir was given on a given day, if you take day 14, for instance, more patients had recovered and, uh, uh, what they, and they went on to estimate that uh, the duration of hospital stay was reduced by about four days when remdesivir was given. And this benefit was seen in uh, patients needing oxygen as well, but the benefit seems to be less established in patients needing invasive mechanical ventilation or ECMO, as you can see the two lines overlapping in the bottom, bottom plot. So, uh, but as I, say, as I said earlier, I must emphasize that this is uh, the outcome was the hospital, uh, was the duration of hospital stay and not mortality. And this might put it into a, a clearer perspective. And uh, on the right towards right, remdesivir was seen to be better, and towards left, uh, placebo was seen to be better. So uh, consistently, it was seen that the hospital duration was lessened with remdesivir, less so in the bottom part where they, where again they uh, uh, assessed uh, patients on uh, invasive mechanical ventilation and ECMO, uh, but. Uh, that consistent benefit was seen in reducing hospital uh, uh, in reducing hospital stay. So their conclusion after the trial was that uh, remdesivir is superior to placebo in shortening the time to recovery in adults who were hospitalized with COVID-19 and had evidence of a lower respiratory tract infection. So this led to widespread use of IV remdesivir in the US. It's quite an expensive drug. I think in Sri Lankan rupee terms, it's about 50,000 per, per five day course. Um, and uh, so it was not widely used worldwide. Now, hot on the heels of this trial, the WHO published their own study, which was Solidarity. Uh, the Solidarity study uh, trial had several arms where they uh, compared different treatments. And uh, in this study, they compared uh, 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 remdesivir with uh, hydroxychloroquine, then the uh, anti-HIV drugs, lopinavir and uh, ritonavir, and then uh, interferon. Uh, so they, are, they had uh, uh, given remdesivir to 2,750 patients. I forgot to mention in the earlier study, in the NIH study, only 500 patients were put on to remdesivir. So this is a much uh, uh, powered study compared to the previous one and uh, 2,750 patients received uh, remdesivir. And uh, of course, uh, hydroxychloroquine in about 1,000 patients and uh, lopinavir in about another 1,500 patients. Uh, their conclusion at the end of the study was that remdesivir, hydroxychloroquine, lopinavir, and interferon regimens uh, have little or no effect on hospitalized patients with COVID-19. Uh, as indicated by overall mortality, initiation of ventilation, and duration of hospital stay. So this contract contradicted the earlier study where the uh, US trial showed that there was a lessening of uh, hospital stay, but here there was no benefit seen in that outcome as well. But more importantly, it showed that there was no difference in overall mortality and the need for mechanical ventilation. So the, that was a disappointing result from uh, remdesivir. So now we come to steroids in COVID-19. Now, from the beginning of the pandemic, IV dexamethasone, uh, methylprednisolone, and hydrocortisone were used uh, uh, globally. Uh, and clinicians uh, thought, and they had reported that they, uh, they saw benefit by using uh, steroids. Uh, but there was no very few formal studies which showed a clear benefit and which showed significant evidence. Then the recovery trial group from the Oxford University, uh, they clearly showed that the cheap and widely available drug dexamethasone had showed a significant, statistically significant mortality benefit. And uh, uh, they showed that giving dexamethasone six milligrams IV or oral for 10 days for patients needing oxygen uh, led to a clear mortality benefit. Uh, if we analyze the trial in a bit of detail, now in this trial, about 2000 patients were randomized to use, uh, to receive dexamethasone. Yeah, so we were referring to this uh, steroid trial, dexamethasone in the recovery group. 
And uh, so overall mortality was reduced by dexamethasone and the p-value was significant, uh, 0 0.001. And then if you analyze the subgroups, uh, this uh, uh, benefit was seen in all types, like say in patients who, were ne who needed oxygen and, uh, uh, and in patients who needed ventilation as well. But if you, uh, if you just see the patients who needed, uh, who did not receive oxygen, uh, there wasn't a statistically significant benefit shown. So primarily patients who needed oxygen did well with IV dexamethasone. So their conclusion was that in patients hospitalized with uh, COVID-19, the use of dexamethasone resulted in uh, lower 28-day mortality among those who were receiving either invasive mechanical ventilation or oxygen alone at randomization, but not among those receiving, uh, uh, but not among those receive, uh, without uh, uh, receiving oxygen support. So uh, the, the primary, uh, 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 the, the important point that the trial brought out was that patients who needed oxygen did well when they were given IV dexamethasone, but not patients who did not need oxygen. And in fact, there was a tendency towards harm. So this has to be borne in mind when we manage our patients. Uh, now the steroid dose recommended is, I mean, the, the, the trial of course uh, used uh, dexamethasone, uh, IV or oral six milligrams daily for 10 days. But then the equivalent of that is oral methylprednisolone 32 milligrams daily for 10 days, oral prednisolone 40 milligrams daily for 10 days, and IV hydrocortisone 50 milligrams eight hourly for 10 days. The good thing is that we have uh, uh, very uh, uh, easy access to IV dexamethasone and IV hydrocortisone and oral prednisolone in this country. So that, that is a big boon uh, in treating patients. Now, there is a controversy regarding the dose of steroid. Now, I, I think as clinicians, sometimes we feel that some patients may benefit from a higher dose of steroid, but the trials that have been done so far have not shown a clear benefit of using high dose steroid. Actually, there are some other trials which have shown benefit, but they have been rather small studies so uh, no concrete uh, evidence has emerged that higher dose steroid, uh, steroids could, uh, uh, could benefit these patients. Uh, so as of now, I think the stand in most world guidelines, WHO, NIH, NICE, and in other guidelines, and of course in the Sri Lankan guideline as well, we stick to this dose of dexamethasone, six milligrams IV. Uh, that is not a low dose, it's sort of a, a middle of the range dose. Uh, but I mean, trials are trial, trials are being done, so we may hear differently in future. But as as of now, uh, I think the guidelines recommend this dose. But of course, there is a place for a higher dose of steroid. Uh, there, in COVID patients who who come through the acute stage and towards the latter part of the second week or maybe early part of third week, some of the patients can develop an NTT call acute fibrinous organizing pneumonia. Now, this condition, of course, uh, requires a higher dose of methylprednisolone, uh, probably about 250 milligrams daily for about three days, uh, initially to be followed up by, uh, by oral prednisolone. So that is a, that's a, a definite uh, sort of indication in a subset of patients. Uh, now, the other issue with steroids is that we, I mean, it's not just the acute survival of patients that we need to be uh, 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 cognizant of. We should know the mortality at 28 days and mortality probably at, at 60 days as well. Uh, in patients who are given high dose steroids, where they may come to the initial part, but they may have issues later on. We know that high dose steroids could cause uh, major issues in their uh, glycemic management. You know, these patients have very high sugars, especially diabetic patients when they get COVID-19 and that itself would lead to cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. And then again, this huge issue of secondary bacterial and fungal infections. Now say, uh, we know what issues are there in our ICUs with uh, pseudomonal infections and other, other gram negative infections, and also uh, fungal infections like aspergillosis in the acute phase. 
And then later on, now we do hear from India that there is this condition called mucomycosis, which is causing uh, lots of issues in India. So higher steroid dose are linked with uh, more secondary bacteria and fungal infections, and this has to be taken into account when we decide on the steroid dose. Now, steroid trials, there are quite a few in progress. There is one COVID steroid 2 trial where IV dexamethasone 6 milligram versus 12 milligrams is being tried out in some European countries and in India uh, in about 1,000 patients. So that should be an interesting study to uh, see the results of. And then uh, uh, there is another study where they compare the, uh, compare the impact of dexamethasone versus metaquidnisolone. Uh, upon the neutrophil lymphocyte ratio in COVID-19 patients. And then DEXA-COVID-19, another randomized clinical trial in mechanically ventilated patients, uh, uh, where dexamethasone is used in a high, at a higher dose, 20 milligrams daily for five days, and uh, then cut down to 10 milligrams daily for five days. So these trials may show some interesting data. I think one other thing that happened was that once a recovery trial data came out, some of the trials were abandoned because of, you know, uh, 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 some of the patients were randomized not to receive any treatment in those uh, other trials. So it was not ethical to do that any further because of the recovery uh, results. So most of the trials were abandoned. So I think that may be another reason why we are not seeing uh, many other trials reporting on the benefits of steroid and the dose of steroid. Moving on to, can you hear me? Yes, can, we can hear yeah, yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, and uh, uh, moving on to convalescent plasma, slightly a different topic. Now, uh, plasma from, from patients who have recovered from COVID-19 has been used to treat acute infections. Now, this is something that we've been using in other infections like SARS, MERS, H1N1, H5N1, Ebola. The aim is to provide the patient with neutralizing antibodies from a patient, from a person who has had the infection recently, uh, with, the with the hope of uh, giving the body an immune boost, uh, enabling the body to uh, overcome the infection until its own immune, system, immune response is established. So ideally, these patients should be given convalescent plasma very early on in their illness. And of course, the antibody titer should also be high. So US FDA gave emergency use authorization uh, way back in uh, 2020, I think probably towards the middle of, the, uh, middle of 2020. But the trial data was not so convincing. Uh, there was one trial that was published in the NEJ uh, where they used uh, convalescent plasma in severe COVID pneumonia and uh, uh, symptom onset to enrollment was about a uh, median of eight days. Uh, there were 228 patients in the convalescent plasma arm and 105 in the placebo arm. And the antibody titer that was in the plasma was about one in 3,200, which was a very good dose. Uh, and the primary outcome was clinical status and mortality at 30 days. So mortal mortality in the CP arm, convalescent plasma arm, was 10.96% versus 11.43% in the placebo arm. Uh, and I, I think uh, uh, it was not statistically significant. So the conclusion was that uh, uh, there wasn't a, a major difference in the two arms. But of course, one has to bear in mind that the initiation of therapy was at, at a median of eight days, which was rather late in the illness, and uh, it probably is uh, to be expected. Then there was another trial done in India. I think in India, plas conventional plasma was used widely. And uh, the Indians, they, uh, they, a trial called PASID uh, published uh, uh, their work in BMJ. And uh, there they had uh, given conversion plasma uh, and uh, standard care with the two arms. And conversion plasma was given to 235 patients, standard care to 229. And uh, two doses of conversion plasma, 200 ml, were given 24 hours apart. And the main outcome was all cause mortality after 28 days. And again, there was no difference seen between the two groups. Several other studies have uh, shown different results, but the, the, the good thing about conversion plasma is it's generally quite safe and the risk of adverse events is as low as 1%. Uh, so I think it's used in India. We don't use it in Sri Lanka right now, uh, but it was used in a few cases early on in the pandemic.
then there's a lot of interest in this uh, aspect of treatment, monoclonal antibodies in COVID-19. Now, uh, this is, uh, these are synthetically derived antibodies, and uh, uh, the uh, FDA, US FDA gave uh, emergency use authorization to uh, BEM-Lenivimab, uh, which was directed against a spike protein. Now, these drugs are given to patients who are at a higher risk of progressing to uh, chronic, uh, to a higher risk of progressing to uh, severe disease. And uh, uh, I think you may recall that uh, the uh, former president, uh, Donald Trump, received a combination of monoclonal, monoclonal antibodies. Uh, the two combined drugs were Casirivimab and Imdevimab, Imdevimab. Uh, which uh, came under uh, uh, a company called Regeneron, and uh, which uh, is supposed to reduce the viral load and symptoms in non-hospitalized patients. So patients early on in their disease, maybe within the first three days, the patients are, uh, are given this infusion as an outpatient procedure. They are brought to the OPD and given the IV infusion and sent home. But this is quite costly treatment. But now in India, I think they are trying to uh, develop, uh, trying to produce their monoclonal antibodies. There may be a role in preventing disease progression uh, in patients if, if given early. Then we come to this uh, other interesting area of anti-inflammatory therapies. Now, uh, the main drug used in this segment is uh, the anti-interleukin-6 blocker tocilizumab. Uh, which is said to uh, counter the macrophage activation syndrome and thereby counters the cytokine storm. Uh, now, this is widely used in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, so we are familiar with the drug. And uh, there was a trial uh, published in the NEJM in the early part of uh, this year in January, where tocilizumab was given to pac hospitalized patients with COVID-19 pneumonia. Uh, I would uh, uh, refer to this study a little later. And then there was another study called REMAP-CAP. Uh, this was uh, again published in the NEJM, and that showed that tocilizumab and another drug called cellulumab, which are both interleukin-6 inhibitors, were beneficial in the critically ill uh, patients, uh, and that they, they improved outcomes. Uh, so uh, that the, those studies were quite promising. Uh, there are some other uh, and, uh, interleukin-6 uh, inhibitors as well, the IL-1 inhibitor and a Kinra. And then there's a drug, there's an oral drug as well, uh, genus kinase inhibitor boricitinib, which is used in combination with IV remdesivir according to US FDA guidance. Uh, so these are in addition to steroids. That point has to be stressed and uh, it is uh, the benefits if at all, would be in addition to what is uh, given by steroids. Now, this was a study I alluded to earlier, so published in the, in the NEJM. Uh, so it concluded that in hospitalized patients with COVID-19 pneumonia who were not receiving uh, mechanical ventilation, tocilizumab reduced the likelihood of progression to the composite outcome of mechanical ventilation or death. Now, but the main trial uh, that showed benefit in tocilizumab again came from the recovery trial group in the UK. Uh, there was a preprint uh, about three months ago, and uh, that said that uh, patients with the hypoxia, that is with an oxygen saturation less than 92% on air, or requiring oxygen therapy, and evidence of systemic inflammation with a CRP of over 75 milligram per liter were randomized to use standard of care or the usual standard of care plus tocilizumab. Now remember the standard of care included dexamethasone. So the dose of tocilizumab, use, uh, of tocilizumab that was used was 400 milligrams, that's roughly about eight milligrams per kg uh, to 800 milligrams. It was given as an IV infusion, and in exceptional cases, the second dose was given 20 to 24 hours later. So around 2,000 patients were in each arm, and again, importantly, the primary endpoint was the 28-day mortality. Now, patients allocated to tocilizumab were more likely to be discharged from hospital alive within 28 days, 
and the comparison showed show the statistically significant result of a p-value of 0 0.0001. So that's quite significant. Um, and among those not on invasive mechanical ventilation as baseline, patients allocated tocilizumab were less likely to reach the composite endpoint of invasive mechanical ventilation or death. So that was also quite significant. So their interpretation was that in hospitalized COVID-19 patients with hypoxia and with cystic uh, severe systemic inflammation, tocilizumab improved survival and other clinical outcomes. And these benefits were seen regardless uh, of the level of respiratory support and were additional to the benefits of steroid. Now, although it sounds promising, we probably are yet to define the exact therapeutic window for tocilizumab and it should be very carefully chosen. The patient should be on IV dexamethasone, should have been on IV dexamethasone for at least 48 hours, should have been established on that. And even while the patient is on that, if the patient's oxygen demands are rising, and if the patient's uh, uh, saturation is not maintained, if the CRP is high, about 75 milligram per liter, and then if the other markers like serum ferritin uh, serum LDH are also high, then tocilizumab can be used provided that there is no established bacterial sepsis. So in most centers, there's a practice of doing a procalcitonin level to make sure that uh, there is no bacterial, significant bacterial sepsis going on because in that situation, if you give tocilizumab, the results could be quite detrimental. So it is in an option in selected cases. Now, there are quite a few contraindications to use of tocilizumab, active TB, herpes zoster, sepsis, GI perforation, multiple sclerosis, allergy to tocilizumab, and high liver enzymes, low platelets, severe neutropenia. So quite a few things to, uh, uh, quite an uh, extensive checklist to go through before you start the patient on tocilizumab. So I think it is advisable to start tocilizumab uh, after a sort of an MDT meeting where uh, experts get together and assess the risk, uh, the benefit versus the risk. Anticoagulation in COVID-19. Now, these patients, as I said earlier, since they have significant inflammation, uh, that itself is, is uh, 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 prone to cause thrombosis. And in fact, uh, quite a few post-mortem studies have shown uh, the extent to which uh, thrombosis occurs in these patients. There was one interesting study from Italy where they had studied about 20 patients. And there they had, out of the 20 patients, they had found uh, four patients with uh, pulmonary embolism. But in the other 15, they actually uh, uh, saw microthromba in the lung at autopsy. So, I mean, that seems to be a general mechanism. Uh, some of them may come out as a, a frank pulmonary embolism, but some others will just have microthromba in the lung, which may be causing all the issues uh, that lead to hypoxia. Uh, so in hypoxic patients needing oxygen, low molecular weight heparin is uh, uh, given as prophylaxis when the patient gets uh, admitted to hospital uh, to prevent uh, venous thromboembolism. Uh, now, a usual dose would be about 40 milligram uh, uh, subcut daily. And of course, if the EGFR is less, you start at a lower dose of about 30. Then in patients with end-stage renal failure and patients on dialysis, unfractionated heparin is a better choice. Now, there is a little controversy about the, anti, uh, the enoxaparin dose, the anticoagulant dose as well. Now, uh, NICE guidelines say that uh, they uh, prefer an intermediate dose of about one milligram per kg uh, given twice a day. Uh, rather than the, the preventive dose in patients who present to hospital. But in most other guidelines, uh, it's uh, recommended to start at a, uh, at a prophylactic dose and go up in case there is a rise in D-dimer or there is a, a abnormality shown in the, in the thromboelastography. Or indeed, if there is a clinical suspicion now, that alone is enough. If there is a clinical suspicion of uh, venous thromboembolism, that is good enough reason to uh, step up on the dose. So we generally have a low threshold for stepping up to a treatment dose, which is about uh, uh, 1.5 milligram per kg subcut daily. Again, the renal adjustments have to be made. Now, uh, 
Another important aspect is, uh, uh, is the risk of bleeding. Now, as I said, uh, even in NICE guidelines, even though they initiate at a higher dose, they, they recommend cutting down uh, on the dose once the patient is moved on to a ventilator. I think they're worried about uh, lung injury and subsequent bleeding. So the, the risk of thrombosis and bleeding is a continuous, it, it has to be assessed uh, continuously in determining the correct dose to give. And another important thing is when these patients are stepped down from the ICU to a ward, it's important to continue with the anticoagulation. Indeed, if the patient had PE or VTE, the patient will have to be on, on oral anticoagulants, warfarin or, or DOAPS in some instances. And, um, but even in other patients, we probably have to uh, decide whether the patient would benefit from a course of uh, anticoagulation. That's an individual decision based on the risk of thrombosis and bleeding. And that's an area quite a few studies are going to report on soon. Aspirin in COVID-19 is another important topic. And uh, it is postulated that aspirin helps in these patients. Actually, the interest came through a retrospective study, not in RCT, which was done in the University of Maryland. And it was published in the, the journal Anesthesia and Energesia, where they compared 98 patients who were on aspirin uh, either one week before hospital admission or started on aspirin within 24 hours of admission with 314 patients who were not on aspirin. And um, results showed that in the aspirin arm, patients were 43% less likely to need ICU care, 44% less likely to need invasive mechanical ventilation, and 47% less likely to die in hospital. So that's quite significant data, although it was an observational study. Um, now, but there have been other studies, particularly one done in China, in Wuhan, where they had used aspirin in the early part of the pandemic, but they came out with the conclusion that it did not help uh, COVID-19 patients. So, uh, but I think the debate is on and there's a very important trial that's going on again under the recovery trial group. They have added aspirin to one of their arms and they will be reporting, I think they're close to report on this as well. So we will know in the near future whether aspirin does indeed have, uh, have, a, have an effect. In Sri Lanka, our policy is to continue aspirin in patients who have a high cardiovascular risk. And in patients who were not on aspirin and if their cardiovascular risk is assessed to be high, assessed to be high, again, they, they can be placed on aspirin. But we have not decided whether they should, whether aspirin should be given to COVID-19 patients without obvious cardiovascular risk. So that is something that we have to uh, decide on based on trial evidence in future. Another hot topic is ivermectin in COVID-19. Now, uh, ivermectin, as we all know, is a very cheap, generally safe drug, and uh, it, it showed very high efficacy uh, against uh, coronavirus 2 in in vitro studies. In fact, the efficacy was several times more than that of uh, HCQ. So, but uh, in the early part of the pandemic, that was not used that much. And uh, there have been uh, uh, small RCTs which have reported uh, on 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 their on their uh, result uh, uh, on on the benefit of uh, ivermectin um, and some observational studies as well. There was an observational study done in Florida, USA, which was reported in the journal Chest. I think that created an interest in this molecule. It had shown a, a mortality benefit uh, with ivermectin, but in that study design. Most of the patients who were given ivermectin were on a higher dose of steroids. So it was, well, it was a confounding variable which they could not adjust for. So the result was not very clear. And uh, there are several other small RCTs from Egypt, Iraq, and a few other countries, and some in the US as well. Uh, they have report, given mixed results, uh, some positive results and some negative results and some large RCTs are going to report, so we may know in future. Then there was this article, actually it was a review article by one Dr. Corey in uh, the American Journal of Therapeutics, which, which uh, uh, drew attention uh, of worldwide uh, uh, scientists. And um, uh, they went on to say that according to their review, uh, the uh, emerging evidence for ivermectin was strong for prophylaxis and treatment. Uh, now, the US FDA, uh, to, in, the, in the middle of 2020, 
they uh, categorically said that ivermectin did not have a place and they recommended against, but then they went on to uh, 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 sort of change that uh, guidance uh, to say that there is insufficient evidence to recommend for or against ivermectin for the treatment of COVID-19. So they have left it open and um, they are evaluating the studies. Uh, so this could be used for pre and post exposure prophylaxis as well. Uh, I, if I am, if I may comment, uh, I think in Sri Lanka also we, we do have a couple of studies that are being planned in patients with early disease, uh, whether ivermectin has any, uh, any benefit. Uh, so I think the jury is still out there, but it's not used in any, any of the major guidelines. Uh, so, so far that is not standard treatment, um, but the interest uh, is because it's a cheap drug and, uh, and it could, could be beneficial if trials uh, do show benefit. Now, getting on to a few novel therapies. Uh, now, there is this antiviral drug called mol molnopiravir, which is uh, actually it's a drug that was used in influenza to, to some extent, but they, that was used as a different form. So now they have developed a pro-drug. And uh, that this is what is being trialed out in, uh, in, uh, uh, in the US and in some other countries. It's an oral antiviral, and uh, uh, the mechanism of action is that it introduces copying errors to viral RNA, interfering with the viral replication. At the moment, it's in, in a phase three trial, a global trial comprising 180, 50 patients, and uh, it's called move out. Um, so the results are awaited. Uh, so it, it's given to patients within the first five, day of, first five day, days of the illness, uh, as an outpatient treatment. Uh, it has been used in severe disease, but the results have not been good. So it's, it's, the, its only place, if at all, would be in early disease. And a prevention trial is also being planned, but uh, it's a, the main advantage is that it's an oral drug. But most of the ant oral antivirals have not been very useful in, uh, in COVID-19, as uh, shown by our experience with, uh, uh, with, the, with the earlier uh, 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 touted drug uh, favipiravir, which was uh, said to be, uh, which was uh, pro which had some promise, but it did not show uh, any significant uh, mortality advantage in trials. So we we have to be we have to wait and see what this what comes out of this trial. Then some interest is there in nitric oxide uh, now uh, in the inhaled form. Now this is actually uh, used. Both in the both for uh, prophylaxis as well as for acute treatment. Now, inhaled nitric oxide was shown to improve oxygenation in ventilated patients with COVID-19 in Brompton Hospital in UK. Uh, what they said was that it improved the uh, uh, ventilatory efficiency at 24 hours, and the benefit had lasted up to five days. But it was only a small study of about 35 patients, so a larger trial is planned. So it may show some promise. Uh, then there is this intranasal spray uh, called Sanotize. It's basically intranasal nitric oxide spray. Um, and uh, there is a, a phase two trial going on in the UK and Canada. And nitric oxide, nitric oxide is a nanomolecule which is postulated to kill SARS-CoV-2 virus two in the nose inhibiting by inhibiting viral replication. So there is potential for use as early treatment. Uh, if I may mention another intra intranasal treatment, that is uh, the inhaler budesonide. Uh, now that has been used in a, in a small study, had shown some benefit, but uh, a larger study is planned. So that's another thing that uh, we could sort of uh, look forward to. And then there is this experimental therapy. Uh, it's called ExoCD24. It's an inhaled drug. It was, I think, given wide publicity uh, came out from a medical center in Israel. Uh, and it's used in uh, uh, moderate to severe disease to counter cytokine storm. Basically, it's an exosome-based uh, particle which delivers CD24 directly to the lungs. Uh, the center said that they had uh, uh, data of 30 patients with moderate COVID-19 being given the drug. And uh, most had improved uh, within uh, three to five days. Uh, but it's just in uh, phase phase one study, so we have to wait for the results. So uh, an important thing, the WHO, what's the WHO guidance? They have a living guideline which they update from time to time. So ivermectin is recommended only in research settings. 
hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine, there is a recommendation against uh, lopinavir uh, and ritonavir, again, recommendation against remdesivir, conditional recommendation against systemic corticosteroid in severe or critical illness, strongly recommended, and system, systemic corticosteroids in non severe illness, recommendation against. I think this is an important point because there are lots of patients uh, early on in the illness who have viral replication going on and who are unfortunately started on steroids. Now that will blunt the immune response and will prolong the viral replication and with uh, deleterious effects. So it's important for us not to start steroids in these patients who present early. And it's only when they turn hypoxic that we have to uh, start on steroids. So again, detection of hypoxia is a very important thing in those patients. So just a brief uh, uh, a recap of what's done in Sri Lanka. Now patients are, are, are managed in uh, intermediate care centers and hospitals of varying grades. And uh, patients are categorized and they are if patients with uh, comorbidities are, 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 are treated at level two or maybe even in uh, specialized COVID centers. So patients are started on low dose aspirin if they have high cardiovascular uh, uh, risk. And uh, then uh, uh, when the patient becomes hypoxic with a saturation level of 94 or less, they are started on IV, IV or oral dexamethasone. Now this hypoxia, one has to be careful about. Uh, some patients may look, uh, uh, look quite comfortable at rest. They have this phenomenon called happy hypoxemia, but when they exert with, slight, with the slightest exertion, they can desaturate a lot. lot. So we have to detect these patients very carefully. We have to monitor them. And in, in those patients with hypoxia, uh, uh, that's demonstrated it's important to initiate the chain of treatment. Uh, so dexamethasone is given for 10 days. Then of course, VTE treatment with enoxaparin and the dose is uh, depending on the patient. And uh, then of course, the, uh, the gamut of ventilatory strategies that we use, I'm not going to uh, talk on those things, antimicrobial therapy when appropriate. And patients, if they do need in, uh, intubation, they have to be intubated early. And by delaying intubation, if they're not tolerating NIV, I think we will be uh, likely to cause more issues. But the final emphasis, e emphasis is placed on fine-tuning supportive care. That is very important uh, because uh, as we look for a wonder drug, as we look for uh, refining our drugs, it's very important to take into account the management steps because there was a trial, uh, there was a study that came out from Boston in the early part of the pandemic where they didn't use any specific drugs at all. So in that uh, uh, Boston ICU, they had brought down mortality to, mortality to 15% with standard care of a viral pneumonia. So that's very important to uh, bear in mind. So these are my references and thank you very much for your patient listening. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Harsh Satishchandra, uh, for that excellent uh, coverage on, uh, of, on therapeutics of COVID-19. And I think in the current times, it's a very important topic. You have covered it comprehensively. There are lots of questions which are asked to the chat forum, but we will take all those at the end of the second presentation uh, so that we can have an effective uh, discussion. So uh, it is now my pleasure to invite uh, uh, Professor Nilika Malavige. I don't think again, uh, we don't need uh, any introduction uh, uh, to Nilika, to this audience as well as the uh, public. Uh, Nilika has done some wonderful work uh, on uh, COVID-19, um, the virus, as well as the immunogenicity. And uh, so we are, I'm very grateful to Nilika for accepting our invitation um, from the therapeutics, from the drugs committee of the SLMA uh, for sharing your expertise on the vaccines and variants in COVID-19. Over to you, Nilika. Uh, thank you so much, Madam. Uh, now I'll be giving update about vaccines, but it's difficult to talk about vaccines. Uh, because one question a lot of people have is, will these vaccines work against uh, these upcoming variants? How dangerous are these? And uh, what sort of protection is offered by vaccines? Uh, are antibodies okay? Is any antibody okay? So these are the uh, questions that people are having. Uh, and uh, this is just how where we stand and the rest of the world stand as of 30th of May. Uh, and as you can see, the highest 
uh, incidence of the epidemic currently uh, is in Latin America and also in uh, South Asia. So in, in Sri Lanka and uh, the rest of South Asia, uh, the incidence is between 500,000 per 1 million uh, per 100,000 population, but uh, in the last week, I believe uh, it has increased further. And uh, so it's not just something that is experienced by Sri Lanka. When you look at the Southeast Asian uh, region, uh, we, have, we see a upward trend in Thailand, uh, Nepal, and so on, Maldives, and so many other countries uh, because of introduction of these different types of variants. Uh, and of course, unlike Europe, which saw the outbreak last year and end of last year, beginning of this year, most of Europe and uh, US, the Western countries have begun uh, a very successful vaccination campaign. Uh, and because of, uh, uh, because of, of course, we don't have money. Uh, the Asian countries uh, don't have money. We are far lagging behind that, and I'll talk about that. Now, this is, of course, the daily new confirmed cases per million people again as the 4th of uh, June. And uh, so this is where Sri Lanka stands uh, compared to some other uh, South Asian countries. Bangladesh, Pakistan are currently having a low incidence uh, compared to Sri Lanka. And India did have a really bad situation some time ago, uh, but the number of cases in India have decreased, whereas uh, we are a bit, uh, quite a bit higher than India right now. So somebody can argue, okay, that is because India is not testing enough, uh, whereas we are testing enough. Uh, so this is, uh, the test positivity rate. And as you can see, as of 3rd of June, uh, our test positivity rate is around 14.7%, whereas in India it is less. So uh, the positivity rate also is a uh, indication of uh, the proportion of te uh, tests being done. So per uh, India is doing far more tests per thousand population than us. And uh, Nepal is having the highest positivity rate along with Latin America with over a uh, uh, 20 to 30 percent uh, positivity rate, whereas Sri Lanka is, is around here. And uh, in most labs, the positivity rates are increasing. And our lab, which uh, which does the Columbia Municipality Council area, the positivity rates have increased gradually over time, and it has it is currently over 20 percent uh, in, in from our in the CMC uh, from our lab. Uh, so questions that people have been asking, of course, is about the lockdown. I mean, a lot of uh, South Asian countries are currently under the lockdown, whereas Europe and America have come out of it. So because uh, the, the shift epicenter of the epidemic currently is in Asia. And uh, of course, then we have all these weird variants coming up in different countries. Uh, Vietnam uh, announced something like a hybrid of the Indian UK variants, which they retracted the statement later. But of course, there's a lot of confusion about these variants. And then, of course, whether how good these vaccines are uh, in preventing transmission versus symptoms, and, and uh, but why does that matter? And of course, articles coming out in Nature, uh, the most reputed journal, saying five reasons why COVID herd immunity is probably impossible. So that sounds very alarming and bad news. So before we talk about vaccines, I will just briefly take you through variants and uh, why variants matter and uh, how it impacts vaccine efficacy. Uh, now, to understand variants, you just need to know a diagram of the virus. So I won't talk about the virus, just that it looks like a crown. Uh, that's why it's called a coronavirus. And this spike protein is uh, where the virus attaches to the host protein, which is the H2 receptor. So this is the spike protein, and it uh, nicely attaches to this H2 receptor. And it attaches to this H2 receptor by the receptor binding domain, as it, it binds to the receptor. So is the receptor binding domain that is most important uh, structure of the spike protein as far as attachment is concerned. And so this is a picture of the spike protein. Uh, and the reason I'm putting up this picture is, uh, of course, most vaccines contain the spike protein and individuals vaccinated or after natural infection develop antibodies to the spike protein. So some of the antibodies are to the receptor binding domain, whereas some of the antibodies are to various other places in the spike protein. But so antibody positivity alone is not going to help because it's certain type of antibodies uh, that are more helpful or important in uh, preventing reinfection uh, uh, after COVID vaccine or natural infection. And these are called the neutralizing antibodies. So this is the virus, which of course binds to the ACE2 receptor, to the receptor binding domain. So the neutralizing antibodies are those that bind to the receptor binding domain and prevent 
the receptor binding domain engaging with the ACE2 receptor, in other words, preventing infection. So it gives these neutralizing antibodies that are critical for protection and not antibodies that are directed against other sites of the spike protein. And of course, when the uh, COVID virus is quite a smart virus, most viruses are. So when it wants to spread, uh, it, it wants to do two things. So if, if, if a virus wants to spread, then the binding between the receptor binding domain and the S2 receptor has to be really, uh, the affinity has to be higher, so better binding. So better binding, of course, would increase transmissibility. So then it would acquire certain mutations that increase this by strength of binding. The other uh, mutations that happen is to uh, escape recognition by these neutralizing antibodies. So because of certain mutations, the neutralizing antibodies that are there after infection or vaccination can't bind to the receptor binding domain. So the virus is able to reinfect individuals who are already infected or who have been vaccinated. So there are hundreds of variants out there. And of course, these hundreds of variants are not of concern. Of course, the virus mutates, it's an RNA virus. Uh, the virus acquires around two mutations per month. Uh, and, and given the number of variants, that's a lot of uh, variants out there, but we are not concerned of those. So the variants that we are concerned, are uh, named as the variants of concern, uh, are, uh, there are four named by the WHO, and this is because either they increase transmission, increase disease severity, uh, escape neutralizing antibodies, or evade diagnosis by PCR. So these are the four uh, variants currently uh, named by the WHO. Uh, although uh, people were referring to them by their country name because it was stigmatizing the countries, the WHO has come up with these Greek uh, letters, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. So the alpha is the UK variant, B117, beta, South African variant, B1351, uh, gamma, the Brazilian variant, and the delta. B1617.2, uh, which is the Indian variant. Uh, now, these variants are, are quite problematic and it's difficult to escape from them. Uh, so if you take the alpha variant, or in other words, the UK variant, it is currently present in 160 countries and is the most important cause of, of the outbreaks that occurred in so many countries. And because it is highly transmissible, uh, it, uh, it, it, uh, after introduction to a particular country, it wiped out the other variants and became the dominant one. That is, of course, until some other things, other variants came. Uh, now, there is, of course, the beta variant, uh, the South African variant, again, present in 130 countries. I know Sri Lanka is also highlighted, but we have only identified it within the quarantine facilities. And then the gamma variant, which is the Brazilian variant, uh, which uh, has not been uh, identified in many countries, is not as transmissible uh, as, as these ones, uh, uh, based on the evidence. And then the troublesome Indian variant or the Delta variant. So right now it's present in 62 countries. It has been reported in Sri Lanka, but again, only uh, within quarantine facilities, not in the community as of today. Uh, it, this can change tomorrow, uh, depending on uh, the amount of PCR and the amount of sequencing that we do. Now, the these variants, because of the higher binding affinity based on the mutation, then they are able to be able to transmit in a faster manner. So mutations in this receptor binding domain increase the binding to the S2, and this can result in uh, more cells infecting with lower viral loads because of increased affinity and higher viral loads produced by infected cells. So in other words, so that results in a lot of viruses in the respiratory secretion, which are able to infect higher number of individuals. And when you have mutations in the receptor binding domain, uh, the, the, they escape uh, the neutralization by the neutralizing antibodies. So they can reinfect individuals who have already had COVID-19, which has also been seen in Sri Lanka, actually, a few people, uh, and can infect individuals have, who are fully vaccinated Again, we have seen this in Sri Lanka, yeah? and Sri Lanka is not unique. I mean, it's been seen all over the world. So how does this affect uh, transmissibility? So I'm not an epidemiologist, uh, but r naught is important as vaccines and uh, these variants are concerned. So r naught is uh, the number, basically the transmissibility of a virus. So r naught is a derivative of the duration of infectivity and the likelihood of transmission uh, of the infection per contact. So if you take COVID, it infects around, uh, on an average, 2 to 2.5 individuals. Uh, H1N1 was 1.2 to 1.6, and Ebola 1.6 to 2. 
So all the COVID is more highly transmissible than H1N1 and Ebola. It is far less transmissible than viruses such as measles, which are very much airborne, uh, polio, my, uh, polio, rhinovirus, smallpox, and so on. But what happens is when you have variants, uh, for instance, the UK variant, B117 or the alpha, that increases R0 value by a median of 0.5. So uh, R0 value increasing by 0.5 would mean like 2.5 to 3 people will be infected by COVID, uh, the SARS-CoV-2, instead of uh, this value. And this changes the transmission dynamics in a very big manner. And so this is the estimated R0 value of uh, in our region. And uh, if, if the R0 value is less than one, uh, the epidemic slowly dies off, which, which we are, as you see, in Pakistan, Nepal, and India. Uh, but uh, in Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, the R0 value is still above one. Uh, so we have an epidemic which is increasing right now. And coming to variants. Now, uh, we have been sequencing since onset. And uh, at the beginning of the epidemic, there were not many viruses to sequence in the first place. But then we had this uh, outbreak starting uh, in, in a clothing factory in, in early October, end of September. And that was we found due to a unique Sri Lankan variant called the B1411, which was the only circulating variant in the country till about uh, end of March, according to our sequencing data. I mean, we did have the UK variant introduced in, in seen in the quarantine facilities early January, mid January, and so on but it was not detected in the community. And uh, so when you look at the clinical features, uh, although there were lots of people infected by this uh, so-called Sri Lankan variant, uh, especially in the CNC, uh, the likelihood of causing severe disease was far less as we're seeing right now. But with the introduction of the UK variant or the alpha into the community, it completely sort of got rid of, uh, of the Sri Lankan variant because of its much higher transmissibility. So this is, uh, uh, example, living example of uh, evolution or survival of the fetus, which is a much highly transmissible uh, vi uh, vi uh, viral variant coming in and completely wiping out the existing uh, variant in the country. Uh, so this is a, a nice example of evolution, how it works. And coming to transmissibility, okay, the alpha variant is bad, but now we know that the delta variant is worse. So when you compare the alpha variant and the delta variant, the delta variant is 50% more transmissible than the alpha variant or the UK variant. So you can imagine what sort of devastation happens when you get a delta variant. So this is just the transmissibility of the delta variant compared to all other variants out there. And so that is quite bad news. And this is when the delta variant is introduced to how, how it overtook all other variants and became the dominant variant very soon in many countries that it was introduced in. And of course, uh, uh, apart from the transmissibility, mortality is important. And uh, so this uh, Delta variant uh, has shown to sort of increase, uh, associate with increased stability, but so has the Alpha variant. Uh, in, in countries where the Alpha variant or the V117 was introduced, it, it was shown to have higher mortality and higher symptomatic infection than the previous variants. Of course, that is about the variants. And uh, that, that doesn't sound very nice, of course, but then will vaccines get out, get out, out of this mess? Because that's uh, the hope of everybody. Now, this is, uh, uh, I'm just showing the number of individuals uh, vaccinated in our region, because I, I don't think we can compare our region with uh, US or, or Europe, because we don't compare our region with the rest of uh, like Europe or US for other parameters. So when we look, look at our region, about 9% of Sri Lankans have been vaccinated at least uh, one dose uh, versus about 14% in India. And although we might be lagging behind in, in the vaccination program compared to Europe and, and US, uh, we are doing far better than many other countries. So of course, there was a very uh, fast vaccine rollout in UK and many other countries because of the high case load and the higher mortal mortality experience. And uh, all countries uh, try to get as much as uh, much out of vaccines as possible. So uh, uh, for instance, in the UK, uh, they used all the doses in the vaccine. So the vaccines uh, of AstraZeneca and Pfizer had extra doses, so they used that. Unfortunately, although we were, uh, we were in a difficult situation with vaccines, Sri Lanka is one country that did not use this extra dose in the COVID shield vaccine, at least uh, during early during the vaccination program, which is unfortunate. Now, 
come into WHO approved vaccines. Uh, there are uh, several types of uh, WHO approved vaccines, the mRNA vaccines, vector vaccines, and inactivated vaccines. I think everybody knows about the mRNA vaccines, the Pfizer and Moderna. Uh, the vector vaccines are the uh, one that was given here, Oxford, AstraZeneca, Covishield vaccine, uh, and the Johnson & Johnson. And the inactivated vaccines are Sinopharm and uh, Sinovac. Now, this is just a comparison of the efficacy of the different vaccines. Uh, the Sinopharm and Sinovac have not been included in this analysis, uh, but this analysis depends on what, is, what has been published. But we have to understand that when we are comparing efficacy between vaccines, the vaccine protocols were different, the primary endpoints were different, and the circulating variant at, the, at a given time in that country was different. So all those uh, things can affect vaccine efficacy, uh, but given all that, uh, uh, the vaccine efficacy of uh, Pfizer and Moderna was around 94%, uh, along with the, uh, the Sputnik being 91%, uh, and lower efficacy rates for AstraZeneca and the Johnson & Johnson. And so what actually correlates with protection? So, uh, and as I started off, it is the neutralizing antibodies. So the vaccines that generate the most neutralizing antibodies were associated with the uh, most uh, effectiveness. So the mRNA vaccines, the Pfizer and uh, Moderna, actually produce more neutralizing antibodies than individuals who have had natural infection. Uh, and so does Sputnik. So all, all these three vaccines produce higher uh, neutralizing antibodies than convalescent uh, uh, serum. Uh, of, of the Oxford uh, Chedox vaccine is less uh, and, and the uh, Sinovac is less. So that is the efficacy rates directly correlate with the neutralizing antibodies. So the presence of neutralizing antibodies or generation of neutralizing antibodies by a vaccine is the most important thing, not just the mere presence of antibodies. And when actually the real life data was uh, quite different from what was seen by these vaccine trials. So this is a study from Scotland where of course they started uh, immunizing, starting with all the age groups uh, over 90s and uh, coming down in the age groups. And uh, they, so they gave both either the AstraZeneca or the uh, Pfizer uh, one dose. Uh, and after four weeks of uh, giving the vaccine, they saw, uh, they saw a significant reduction in hospitalization, uh, similar, similar rates of reduction in hospitalization after one dose of AstraZeneca or one dose of Pfizer. So in real life, both vaccines equally reduce the uh, rate of hospitalization. Uh, we have also looked at uh, the effect of a single dose of the COVID shield uh, in our healthcare workers. Uh, and a lot of people singing, I, I believe, gave uh, blood for this. So the overall serum conversion after single dose is about 93% at, at four weeks. So there are a lot of individuals uh, collaborating and heading, and it was a huge teamwork doing this. Uh, and we saw uh, sort of same amounts of antibodies. Mind you, these are not neutralizing antibodies in all age, or all age groups, but the serum conversion rates were less in uh, individuals over 60, it was like 81% versus over 90% uh, serum conversion rates in over all age groups. And antibody levels, these are not neutralizing antibodies, were maintained at 12 weeks, uh, at the time of the second dose, we have done neutralizing antibodies, although uh, I'm not showing the data yet. Uh, and we also did this other assays, apart from looking at the uh, original variant, we also looked at uh, antibodies for the B117 or the alpha. So from four weeks to 12 weeks, uh, the antibody levels for the B117 after a single dose had significantly declined in the healthcare workers in Sri Lanka. Now coming to other vaccines, because we, we know that uh, we have Sinopharm and that is the vaccine that is being mostly rolled out uh, in Sri Lanka. Uh, it is inactivated vaccines and as most inactivated vaccines, a single dose is less immunogenic. So uh, this is uh, the antibody levels uh, after a single dose of the uh, Sinopharm vaccine. And at four weeks, just before the second dose also, there was hardly any new vaccine antibodies. It's only 14 days after the second dose that uh, High levels of neutralizing antibodies were seen. So protection only occurs two weeks after the second dose as far as the Sinopharm is concerned. And when you look at the data, uh, the, there are two Sinopharm vaccines, one developed by the Beijing and the other one Wuhan Institute. The Beijing one appears to be more uh, effective than the Wuhan uh, vaccine. And so it, it was effective, 79% uh, uh, or something effective in reducing uh, 
a, a symptomatic infection, uh, but uh, the study was not covered enough to look at uh, severe cases, cases because in the placebo arm, there were only two cases of CV infection versus zero in the uh, vaccine arms. Uh, so, so they were not, uh, the, it was not covered enough to look at the incidence of CV infection, but nevertheless, it was uh, significantly reduced the incidence of symptomatic infection. And so these are the antibody, uh, again, the neutralizing antibody levels after the, uh, after the uh, 14 days after the second dose, which were uh, good levels of neutralizing antibodies. And uh, so about the Sputnik, because we have Sputnik in Sri Lanka as well, and there's this discussion about the first and second dose, and the second doses are possibly being sent. And so uh, this vaccine has two different uh, do uh, doses. The first one is the adenovirus 26 vector, and the second one is adenovirus 5 vector. And uh, so the first dose consists of adenovirus 26, and after a single dose of adenovirus 26, uh, you develop good levels of neutralizing antibodies as shown here. And, uh, and they have already also tried adenovirus 5 separately, which again induces a good level of antibodies. But as you can see, after both doses, the neutralizing antibody levels are much higher than after just one dose. Uh, and so these are the uh, uh, total antibodies, whereas, whereas these are the neutralizing antibodies, which so, show a similar picture. Uh, after the second dose, the neutralizing antibodies boost rather than just with a single dose. And the protection is seen to occur uh, from 18 to 21 days after the first dose, and the second dose in these trials were given at 21 days. Now, uh, of course, then there is this talk about Sputnik Light, the single dose uh, uh, vaccine, and uh, it is adenovirus 26 vaccine. And in the data from um, Russia, uh, which is released as a press release, uh, uh, says that it's 79.4% effective uh, 20 days after administering a single shot. Of course, it, uh, as the data showed, it induces good neutralizing antibodies. But uh, uh, how does that compare with other vaccines? So I just want to show this, I don't know, another adenovirus 26 vaccine. This is a Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Uh, and uh, this paper was out yesterday. And the uh, efficacy against moderate and severe disease was 66.9%. Uh, they hadn't shown data in that study about symptomatic infection because that was not what they, what they were studying in that study. So uh, the, the we don't know. So it is a similar vaccine. The adenovirus 26 to the spice 14 and the Russian first dose is also adenovirus 26. But uh, based on their data at 28 days, it is 79.4% effective. Uh, but uh, there is no data on efficacy rates after this, uh, even published in a press release. Uh, so what about if uh, vaccination of individuals who already have had COVID? That's a question a lot of people are asking. Uh, so the CDC guidelines say, state that uh, uh, anybody who has had COVID infection should be given uh, the vaccine, but the vaccine should be deferred until the person is fully recovered from the illness. WHO says give it after four weeks and also says that uh, you can defer it after six months because it's unusual for people to get infected uh, within a six months period. And this is our data showing after a single dose in, uh, in individuals who were naive, in other words, who were uninfected at baseline, the, their neutralizing antibodies uh, versus people who were infected, their neutralizing antibodies. So you can see infected individuals produce very high levels of neutralizing antibodies uh, compared with a single dose of the COVID shield vaccine compared to uh, naive individuals. And when we look at the uh, antibody responses to all variants, uh, so these are the naive individuals with one dose against all these different variants. Uh, and uh, these are the infected individuals before receiving a single dose. And after uh, receiving a single dose, you can see it pushed uh, almost to the right-hand corner because after a single dose, uh, infected individuals have very high, developed very high levels of neutralizing antibodies. And uh, so uh, a single dose mRNA vaccine in individuals, infected individuals have been studied and, and published. Uh, and data shows that the mRNA vaccine single dose uh, would be enough for infected individuals. Uh, for, for other vaccines, it's not been studied, but this our data is showing that actually a single dose in infected individuals is likely to be using very high levels of antibodies, neutralizing. Now, about uh, regarding the variants, now, when it comes to variants, and, and uh, the Pfizer vaccine is the has shown to be the most effective. It's only the Pfizer and the AstraZeneca has, uh, that have 
data against the Delta or the Indian variant. Actually, the, there is no, no data uh, for the other vaccines against the Delta variant. But this is a publication about the Pfizer vaccine. And this is, these are the neutralizing antibodies for the original variant, uh, the variant that subsequently came, uh, the Alpha variant, UK variant, or South African variant, and the Indian variant. So as you can see, the neutralizing antibodies produced by both two doses of the Pfizer vaccine is less effective against South African and the Indian variant, but, but still you do have neutralizing antibodies. Uh, and this is what is most important, I think. This is after a single dose of the Pfizer vaccine, uh, neutralizing antibodies uh, against the original variant, and after the second dose, and this is against the South African and the uh, Delta variant. And so the uh, beta and Delta variant, as you can see, after a single dose of the Pfizer, there is hardly any, uh, basically no neutralizing antibodies uh, in most individuals against the Delta variant. It's only after the second dose that you develop antibodies. Uh, so uh, for certain variants, one dose will not protect, and this is the importance of giving uh, both doses depending on the variant that you're seeing in the country. And uh, this is the uh, neutralizing antibodies in different age groups. This is the original variant. So young individuals have better, more higher levels of neutralizing antibodies than old individuals for the original variant, subsequent variants, and also the Indian and uh, South African variant. Uh, and how long do these antibodies uh, last? For the original variants, it, it lasts for a long time, even 100 days. But in some individuals, even after both doses, the neutralizing antibodies see, uh, actually reduce to almost non-detectable levels uh, around 100 days after uh, receiving the second dose of the Pfizer vaccine. So the gap between doses, all that, uh, both decisions uh, need to be taken uh, depending on the variant of, uh, around. So for instance, in the UK, when they initially started rolling out the vaccine, because the, uh, the data was there to show that the AstraZeneca vaccine is most effective, efficacy is more when the gap is between 12 weeks and subsequently shown that actually for Pfizer as well, the efficacy was more than the gap between the two doses for 12 weeks. That's what they did. But at that time, what they had was alpha variants. But now because they're having the Delta variant going around the Indian variant, which, which of course uh, is uh, a single dose is less effective, they have reduced the gap between the two doses of, of the uh, uh, AstraZeneca vaccine to uh, six to eight weeks. And of course, even after fully vaccination, uh, people might not be uh, protected. So we, need, we know that Singapore has very high uh, border control uh, guidelines and, and they're very careful about their borders. And uh, because they, they had a lot of people going through the airport even under these circumstances, uh, they uh, used the Pfizer to vaccinate all the airport workers. And uh, we know that uh, Singapore is currently experiencing outbreak because of the Delta variant. And that originated from uh, health uh, airport workers who had fully uh, uh, who were fully vaccinated with either Pfizer or the Moderna. So in other, so these are two very effective vaccines as we know. So the airport workers were fully vaccinated with either uh, uh, Pfizer or Moderna. Uh, they got infected uh, they, uh, asymptomatically and, and just mildly symptomatically. In other words, it went unnoticed. But they took the infection home and infected people at home. And then that is how uh, the Delta variant or the Indian variant got into the community in Sri Lanka. So even after being fully vaccinated, uh, you can transmit infection, but of course you, you will not develop severe disease. So I think one important thing that we need to know is the vaccines protect the person who get the vaccine. They don't protect others. So if I can clarify that, if we have an MMR vaccine, the person who gets the MMR vaccine is protected against MMR. The other people in the house who don't have the MMR will not be protected against uh, the, the infections covered by the MMR. However, if adequate number of individuals in the community, I mean, I, let's say about 90% or actually 95% uh, for MMR uh, are immunized, then the 5% or 10% or who, who are not immunized uh, will not get the infection because of herd immunity. So otherwise, uh, using vaccines uh, to uh, prevent the infection in others is not going to work unless we achieve herd immunity. So vaccines only protect the individual who gets the vaccine. Now, having said that, and the worrying thing that vaccines don't completely prevent transmission, they definitely reduce transmission. I mean, they, the vaccines do have a 
studies have shown that the vaccine is uh, are 56 percent less likely to transmit uh, uh, and, and they have less uh, virus in significantly less viral particles in their respiratory secretions so they do transmit less but nevertheless they can transmit so in an ideal situation if we had a vaccine that uh, prevents infection then after vaccination we would have a significant reduction in, in severe moderate and mild symptoms uh, with a few people having asymptomatic infection but in a if a vaccine prevents disease, in, in this case, COVID-19, but not infection, in other words, people do could have asymptomatic infection, uh, the proportion of people having asymptomatic infection and severe infection will be reduced, uh, but you cannot wipe out uh, the, the infection from the community. So the questions I think uh, that, that we need to answer is how effective will these COVID vaccines uh, uh, will be against the future emerging variants? So will we have variants? Of course we will. And the, way the emergence of variants will depend on how effective the virus is transmitted. So each time the virus replicates, it makes mistakes and you get mutations. So you, give, you should give less chance for the virus to replicate. So this is why it's really important to reduce transmission. Uh, reduce transmission rates, pick up everybody uh, who is positive and isolate them so that they don't infect others. So uh, until we have a lot of people vaccinated, 80%, 90%, or, or, or some number like that, we will have to uh, somehow test and isolate uh, to, to reduce the transmission of the virus so that more and more variants don't emerge and escape immunity. How long immunity will last, that uh, uh, we don't know, but the vaccine trials have shown that, uh, which started last August, that immunity does last following vaccination for around six months or more. And how frequently boost doses should be given and who those are uh, questions that we need to answer. So thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Anilika, for that very comprehensive coverage of the variants as well as uh, on the vaccines. So I think uh, now uh, we can go into the uh, questions. Uh, there are uh, lots of questions asked in the chat forum. Uh, so I'll take one by one. I think the, the first round of questions were mainly on, uh, on the uh, treatment. So uh, I, I invite uh, Dr. Harsha Satishchandra also to uh, join the discussion. Yes, thank you. Uh, so the first question that is there on the chat forum is what is the ideal time to start on steroid therapy for a COVID positive patient? If so, for how long? Yes, over to you, Harsha. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so the exact time is uh, when the patient turns hypoxic. So uh, that is uh, the cutoff that is widely accepted by most guidelines is a saturation level of 94% at rest. Uh, but of course, uh, one has to be careful now. Saturation is, is a fluctuating thing. So one reading may not be enough. You may have to take a few readings. And, uh, and also take into account the fact that some patients desaturate when they, when they exert a little. So one has to be mindful, but generally the guideline is to start on steroids. Uh, that is uh, the standard steroid that we use is IV dexamethasone, six milligrams either IV or orally for 10 days. That's the standard dose. And to be started the moment the patient's uh, saturation on air is 94 or less, 94 or less. So we actually adopt in the Sri Lankan guideline also, we adopt that practice. So that's very clear. And it's, uh, I must emphasize the need to uh, uh, pick up hypoxia because some patients may not seem uh, breathless, but they may be desaturating. Okay, thank you. I think the ne next question also goes out to you. Does doxycycline have a role to play in therapy of COVID positive patients? Uh, no, unfortunately, I think lots of uh, antibiotics have been tried, doxycycline, azithromycin, but there is no, uh, no evidence for uh, uh, benefit through doxycycline. In fact, I think it's very important for us not to start these patients uh, empirically on an antibiotic as soon as they turn PCR positive, because that can lead to antibiotic resistance as well. And more than anything else, it's not necessary. So in the initial phase, I mean, more than uh, close to about 80% of patients do not need specific treatment actually, and they, they can be just monitored. But there, there will be 20% of patients who will need treatment. So in, uh, there is no uh, benefit in starting on any antibiotic empirically. Antibiotics, if at all, are 
uh, probably in the second or third week of illness when there is evidence of uh, bacterial sepsis, and that's based on cultures and other, other evidence. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is uh, for, uh, directed to, uh, to Neelika, but I think you have already answered it. Is it, uh, could vaccination cause false positive uh, rapid antigen test or PCR results? I think you have already answered that. You want to elaborate more on that, Neelika? Yes, so actually the PCR detects a replicating virus and we know that none of the vaccines registered by the WHO, given EUA by the WHO or any country are live attenuated vaccines. So none of the vaccines actually have a replicating SARS-CoV-2. So the PCR cannot be positive and the spike protein also, the antigen detects uh, cannot be positive. Again, it detects replicating, uh, you have to have it in your respiratory secretions and the antigen test actually detect the protein to start with and not the spike protein as uh, most believe. Uh, so, so it's impossible uh, for an antigen test or a PCR to become positive after uh, the vaccination, any vaccine. Okay, good. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, then uh, the next one is, uh, is there, uh, to uh, again, Dr. Harsha Satishtanda, is there a place for oral steroids in asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic uh, uh, patients, I think uh, you were uh, giving the answer during the presentation, but I think it's good to again highlight that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's it's good to highlight that, as you say, Prashini. I think it's uh, the answer is a categorical no. There is no place for steroids in asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic patients. If you remember what I said in the recovery trial, actually they they showed that in the arm where they used uh, IV dexamethasone for patients who did not uh, need oxygen. Uh, there was a tendency towards harm and uh, there was no benefit at all. So steroids should not be given to uh, asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic patients. Okay, thank you. Good. I think it's a point worth highlighting. Uh, yes, then there's another question. Uh, is aspirin started in high cardiovascular risk patients who weren't previously on aspirin? Yes. Yes, I think that is sound policy because say it could be that you know the patient was patient's uh, cardiovascular status was not uh, assessed previously for some reason, and any patient who should be on aspirin based on their cardiovascular risk, uh, I think it's quite quite fair to start them on aspirin, and patients who are already on aspirin must be continued, and of course uh, the debate uh, continues whether patients who don't have a high cardiovascular risk whether those patients will also benefit from aspirin because there have been instances when, instances when patients who were discharged home after clinical recovery, uh, some minor instances where, I mean, a few instances when patients had uh, collapsed and had, uh, had died and there were, there, I mean, there was postulation that whether they, those patients may have had uh, any thrombotic episode. But of course, there's a, there's a big trial which is going to report in the recovery group, uh, and they had used aspirin for patients without any cardiovascular risk as well. So I think we will have to wait for evidence uh, before we decide on that. But certainly for patients with high cardiovascular risk, aspirin should be started. Yeah. So I think you have answered the next question on mildly symptomatic patients who are not on it initially. So that's, I think, asking about the patients who are not having cardiovascular risk. So we have already answered that question. And there's another one. Are there any effect in nutritional supplements like vitamin D, vitamin C, uh, and zinc? Yes. yes there's a lot of yes. interest in that. Yes. That's right. Yeah. I think there are lots of studies have been done, especially with uh, vitamin D, I think. Uh, uh, and uh, because there have been studies which have shown that uh, patients who are deficient in vitamin D, uh, the outcomes uh, due to COVID 19 have been poor. But if you uh, sub-analyze those studies, actually those patients uh, who had low vitamin D levels were also obese and they, like, they were like to be diabetic. And we know for, for a fact that diabetic patients and obese patients have low vitamin D levels. So, and, uh, so it could have been, vitamin D level could have been an innocent bystander in those studies. And it was probably the, uh, the comorbidities which contributed to, to the poor outcome. Uh, so the general recommendation, I think even in the UK, that's the recommendation used. If a person is deficient in vitamin D, that person definitely needs vitamin D supplementation for bone health. I mean, that is something that we, we stress on. So I think in the UK, they, they probably gave patients who were deficient vitamin, in vitamin D about 8, 800 to 1,000 units of vitamin D per day. 
but uh, that's based on uh, vitamin D levels. So I think we cannot give it uh, uh, as a sort of a blanket treatment to all patients with vitamin D. But certainly if somebody is deficient, there is a place for giving vitamin D, not for, uh, for COVID-19, but for, to maintain good bone health. Then uh, with zinc, the, the, the postulation was that uh, zinc has uh, antiviral effects. But then uh, there, there are issues. I mean, it has not been proven uh, in, in uh, RCTs or, or good quality observation studies uh, that zinc uh, enhances, uh, uh, zinc lowers the risk of uh, severe COVID-19, similarly with vitamin C. So as of now, the trials have not shown any, any clear benefit. I think it's very important uh, to maintain good immunity uh, I think a proper uh, good nutritional diet, uh, good uh, uh, number of hours of sleep, and also stopping alcohol, uh, stopping uh, smoking. So those things are, I think, more important than uh, going after you know uh, vitamins and supplements, which may not boost your immunity in the short term anyway. Yeah, I think that's very good piece of advice. Yes, uh, that, that's great. Uh, yes, then there's another question. What are the indications for moderate desaturation tests? In case of positive tests, how does the management differ from uh, an usual management? Yeah, I think probably it's, it, it's uh, a reference to patients who look uh, quite comfortable and they don't have hypoxia at rest. And yes. then they sort of uh, get up to go to the toilet and then when they come back, they, they desaturate. So probably, I mean, uh, one thing is that in, in patients in the initial course of illness, now this doesn't happen on day one or two, probably towards day after day three, day five, like it could happen. So uh, you could, if you if you think that the patient and the patient uh, himself or herself might complain that they feel short of breath after going to the toilet, then what you could do is you could do a, a do a, a under supervision, of course, uh, a test to see you know get the patient to walk about uh, forty steps or get the patient to sit and stand six to eight times within uh, within a minute and see and check pulse oximetry before and after to see whether there is a saturation drop. So that type of patient probably would develop hypoxia at rest in the next maybe 24 to 48 hours. So they have to be monitored carefully. And, uh, and then of course, the, 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 uh, the various treatment measures that we undertake once they turn hypoxic will be, uh, will be needed. And also the, these tests can be done on patients uh, who we think are fit for discharge home. Now, say, let's say the patient has recovered clinically and the patient is in the ward and uh, you want to discharge the patient, uh, it might be a good idea to get the patient to, uh, to have this moderate exercise, you know, the, the two tests that I mentioned. And if they don't do saturate, uh, they do not do uh, desaturate, then, that, then we know that they are quite com comfortable without oxygen, so they could be safely discharged home. So those are the two instances uh, where we could use, I think it's, it's a protocol used sometimes in Sri Lanka as well as in UK. Yeah, okay, I think that, that's great. I think that's very good, uh, uh, you know, uh, two indications that you mentioned. Uh, good. Then the next one is again to you, what is the place for oral anticoagulation on discharging COVID patients who are on anticoagulants in hospital? Uh, place for v vitamin K antagonist and the direct uh, oral anticoagulants duration. Yes. Yes. So, uh, I mean, in... In patients who had uh, actual uh, actual VTE, like say a DVT or a PE, then I think the treatment recommendations are as as the same for any any uh, any general DVT or, or or PE. So we would be putting them on to oral anticoagulation, uh, commonly with warfarin. But of course, uh, I mean the drugs are also uh, drugs can be given. But then I think I don't think we have uh, we have that widely in Sri Lanka. Uh, now, let's say we, we start uh, uh, anticoagulation for patients in the ICU as, as a preventive measure. Then when we uh, step down to a ward, probably we could continue that for a few more days. And when they're sent home, then there has to be an individual risk assessment, whether this patient has a high thrombotic risk or not. So I think you cannot generalize. Uh, even in the UK and other countries, it's an individual decision. There is no uh, sort of... Uh, one therapy fits for all kind of uh, recommendation. So it will have to be done on a case-by-case -case basis if uh, the patient has a high thrombotic uh, uh, tendency. And of course, if you, if, you, if you did think that there may have been a, a, a degree of uh, VTE during the uh, ICU stay or hospital stay, then I think it's quite, uh, quite rational to start them on 
uh, on uh, oral anticoagulant and monitor them carefully. Okay, good. Uh, this one is also related to, uh, again, uh, thrombosis. Person with DVT or cortical vein thrombosis is eligible for vaccination. Probably, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. Now, that is, uh, I think, a little tricky area now. Uh, it depends on, you know, the, the, the duration of, I mean, rather, rather how, how close to the point in which we are uh, trying to vaccinate the patient, the patient develop those issues. Now, one thing that I have to mention is that now, although vaccines have been implicated in uh, thrombosis, uh, if you take COVID-19 uh, infection, uh, the COVID-19 infection itself can cause uh, uh, thrombotic episodes in up to about 50 individuals per, uh, per million cases. And vaccines cause it only up to about five, five, uh, five uh, per million at best. So I think uh, the risk of uh, COVID-19 uh, causing thrombosis is much higher than a vaccine causing it. But of course, in the, in, uh, in, in, if a patient has had, uh, had a thrombotic episode that has to be monitored carefully, it may have been due to COVID as well uh, in this uh, present day, uh, present context. So uh, that has to be assessed and individually assessed by the, by the medical practitioner and uh, decided on. I think uh, Neelika might be able to elaborate further. If, uh... Neelika, you want to comment on that uh, question, please? No, actually, as he said, the, the thrombosis from COVID is uh, uh, much higher than that of following a vaccination. So whether people are having thrombosis are more prone to vaccination is a different question. So this uh, the thrombosis has been reported with the virus uh, vaccines such as AstraZeneca and Johnson and Johnson. So if there is a doubt, maybe you can give a different vaccine such as the Sinopharm. Yeah, and maybe a person with uh, who has had DVT or cortical vein thrombosis perhaps might be on anticoagulants for some time. So maybe they would be protected even in the uh, you know case a vaccine which can give rise to that also is given probably. Uh, yeah, then uh, can uh, individual check for antibodies after vaccinate? Can an individual check for antibodies after vaccination? If so, how long should it be tested? I think Nilika can answer that question. Yes. Yes, so individuals do develop antibodies about 14 days after uh, a vaccination, depending on, a, on the vaccine. So uh, following uh, the mRNA vaccines, the vector vaccines, individuals do develop antibodies 14 days uh, from 14 days after. But for inactivated vaccines like Sinopharm, it is after actually the second dose, as I showed. Uh, so yeah, so if, if people want to test antibodies, there are cases that test it, they can do it. But as I mentioned, just the presence of antibodies don't uh, show anything. It's the neutralizing antibodies that matter, uh, not just, just the presence of any antibody. It's the proportion of neutralizing antibodies that are associated with protection. Okay, yes, good. Uh, the next one is on uh, vaccinating children. Uh, so the question is uh, efficacy and safety of COVID vaccines in children from studies so far. And if we are planning to give it in Sri Lanka, uh, what are the vaccines being considered? I wonder whether you want yes. Yes, uh, so, so actually the vaccines that have been uh, tested are on teenagers, not on ch children actually. And in the Pfizer and uh, vaccine is being given to in US and, and also it will be started in UK soon uh, for children about 12 years of age. Uh, but there have been some reports of myocarditis, uh, but in a very small proportion uh, in the teenagers given these mRNA vaccines. Uh, now, when it comes to Sri Lanka and vaccinating children, I think we know that the, the people who die or, or the mortality is seen in old individuals and all those comorbidities. So I think we can think about vaccinating children uh, after immunizing all the old individuals, uh, all the adults. So I think uh, it will take some time, maybe towards the end of this year, and there'll be better, much more better data about efficacy of vaccines in children. Um, maybe apart from MRNAs, other types of vaccines, maybe there'll be live attenuated vaccines, nasal vaccines toward the end of this year. So then we can consider new data about uh, giving vaccine, vaccines for children after we finish the adult population. Okay, good. Uh, then the next one is, what is the uh, reason for current rapid uh, rate in virus mutation? Uh, is herd immunity worldwide possible with many variants of concern in the committee? I think you uh, addressed that question partly during the uh, presentation, but you, I think you can highlight uh, you know, more. Yes, so, so the high rate of uh, these variants emerging is because of the high rate of transmission. Because the more you let a virus replicate, 
the more mutations the virus will acquire and you get the variants. So the trick here is to stop the virus transmitting as much as possible, either through uh, vaccination or until we get enough uh, people covered uh, through other public health control measures. Uh, so given that we have uh, all these variants around, now all the vaccines actually do protect against the variants. Uh, all vaccines prevent uh, severe disease and moderate disease and, to see, and symptomatic infection to a large uh, uh, effect, irrespective of what variant is out there. So when the WHO was evaluating these vaccines, the endpoints were to prevent severe disease, uh, death, and also uh, symptomatic infection. So irrespective of the variants, all vaccines prevent uh, these, these complications uh, and severe disease. So even after, let's say, uh, we don't completely get rid of the variants or uh, everybody who is uh, vaccinated would, uh, if they're infected with whatever variant, they will only develop mild illness in the form of you know, sore throat or something like that, which we usually get at least once or twice a year for some virus or asymptomatic infection. So if, if that is the case, I don't see any problem with that. Okay, good. Um, this is again regarding uh, immunity. So uh, in due course, tell us how long the immunity is going to last and does vaccination have to be repeated much later to last? And that's from Professor Arjun Ali Vihari asking that question. Uh, yes. Very important question, uh, you know, whether we need to yeah. keep on giving boosters. Yes, yes I think, so, uh, I, I think this uh, answer is connected to the previous answer. So if I can just uh, to talk about the previous answer about herd immunity and things, if we take something like influenza, now, if I ask, for instance, you, how many times you have got influenza in your life by now, you would not be able to give an answer because you don't know. But of course, we know that you have had several infections or incidences of influenza, maybe five, maybe 10, we have no idea. So that is because uh, after you, ha you had influenza as a child or whatever, and you, uh, after, after you get uh, immune, certain immunity influenza, although uh, as an immunocompetent person, when you get repeated influenza infections, you don't develop severe disease. But we know that influenza kills. So if you take the influenza vaccine, the influenza virus changes so much every year. So each at the end of each year, you give flu shots or these influenza vaccines to susceptible people. In, in of course, Western countries where in the winter, uh, you get a high mor morbidity and mortality associated with in influenza. In countries such as ours, we don't give it that much because we don't see this. Uh, I mean, we do see seasonal influenza infection, but the morbidity and mortality due to influenza in Sri Lanka is not as great as uh, the Western countries. So once everybody becomes immune to COVID uh, through vaccination, uh, 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 people will possibly get uh, repeated infections with COVID. So for instance, I might get infected in December, maybe again next year. And uh, as an immunocompetent person, I. I because I've been vaccinated, I might develop asymptomatic or mild COVID, which is fine. But uh, maybe you do need boosters for certain uh, sus susceptible individuals, like old individuals, or those with comorbidities, like we are doing for influenza. Uh, so okay. that is uh, a possibility. Okay, right. thank you. I think that's that's clear. Yeah. So is it all? Uh, then the other one is: is it all right to get two doses of a vaccine from two different vaccine types? I think this is again a, another recurring question that we are having yeah. because we have. Yes. Yeah, so, so there are several data. questions uh, questions about that. So I'll cover all that. So yeah. these mix and match vaccines have been carried out. The trial data is available for AstraZeneca with Pfizer and Moderna. Either AstraZeneca first dose with Moderna and Pfizer as a second dose, or the Pfizer first dose with AstraZeneca and, and uh, whatever second dose. And the trial data show that the immunogenicity and the efficacy is the same, but the reactogenicity is, is uh, more uh, with mix and match. So for instance, we know that when we got the COVID shield vaccine, we didn't feel very great, but with the second dose, it was okay. Uh, but uh, so it's like having another first dose of another vaccine, so the reactogenicity. Uh, but, but the efficacy, and everything else was the same. So the data is there, for AstraZeneca, Pfizer, and Moderna. Uh, now, about Sputnik and AstraZeneca, uh, uh, Sputnik, uh, the first dose and even the second dose is adenovirus vector. So theoretically, there should be no issue in mixing and matching the COVID shield and the Sputnik vaccine. But of course, there is no data. I know that there have been several clinical trials conducted in several countries. So hopefully, the data will be out soon. Uh, and, and we know that we have a proportion of individuals in Sri Lanka 
who uh, have had one dose of uh, COVID shield and awaiting the second. So we either wait, quickly get that data from the countries which did it and uh, give it to our individuals or we have to do a quick trial ourselves because there is no data to find out uh, the efficacy of a COVID shield and Sputnik mix and match. And when you look at inactivated vaccines, mm. again, there is no data about mix and matching uh, the adenoviral vectors with the inactivated vaccines and so on. Theoretically, it should be okay. And we know that people un unknowingly, whether they should do it or not, people who had the COVID shield vaccine did go and get the Sinopharm vaccine in Sri Lanka. There are some individuals who did it, uh, but we don't know what sort of immunity it caused uh, because nobody has studied that. Uh, but without data, it is difficult to comment about the side effects or the uh, efficacy. Yeah, so the next question is about harm combining two vaccine types. So again, again, uh, the evidence is not there. That's what uh, you yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But theoretically, do you think there can be any harm in combining, let's say, AstraZeneca followed by mRNA vaccine or... Uh, uh, so uh, so we, we, yeah. we know that AstraZeneca followed by mRNA vaccine, the data is out there. So it is completely safe as far as AstraZeneca and mRNA or mRNA or AstraZeneca. But theoretically, there should actually be no harm uh, a Sputnik vaccine following the AstraZeneca vaccine, or even an inactivated vaccine like Sinopharm following the AstraZeneca vaccine, theoretically, there should okay. be no harm. Okay, good, yes. Uh, then uh, what are the vaccines suitable for people above 60 years? That's the next question. Yes, uh, so all the mRNA and the adenoviral vectors have uh, been trialed in uh, people over 60. The Sinopharm has been trialed in people over 60. And uh, all these vaccines have shown to be safe in uh, people over 60 years of age. The Sputnik uh, vaccine didn't have enough safety data or the, uh, the, there's a label saying caution, but again, the caution is because there is inadequate data about the efficacy, but uh, there is no issue again in giving uh, any of these vaccines to individuals over 60 years of age, and that age group should be the target age group, uh, the priority age group. Yes. Uh, next one is again on subgroup uh, on uh, P, uh, on uh, women who are exclusively breastfeeding, breastfeeding mothers, so whether there is a vaccine particularly recommended for that group. Yeah, so, uh, so we have the mRNA vaccines, all the adenoviral vector vaccines, which is the AstraZeneca, Sputnik, and Johnson Johnson, those are replicant deficient viruses. In other words, they won't replicate inside your body, so there is no way that the virus can replicate and be transmitted through breast milk. Uh, to the baby, and of course the Sinopharm vaccines, which are inactivated vaccines. So uh, the inactivated vaccines are uh, safe, and the AstraZeneca vaccine, of course, again, there is data and recommendations to go ahead. And uh, there are trials with mRNA vaccines, but these vaccines have been used all over the world, again, in exclusively uh, breastfeeding mothers. There is uh, not, not shown to be any issue. Okay, good. Uh, the next one actually is again on mixing and uh, uh, mixing vaccines. I think you have already answered that question. Will heterologous prime and boost give more protection for emerging variants? Uh, yes. So uh, this prime and boost regime is uh, shown to be more effective than uh, homologous boost. So for, if you take the AstraZeneca vaccine, the first and second doses are similar. And in the Sputnik vaccine, we have an adenovirus 26 and a 5, so it's a prime and boost regime. So this is why we are seeing a higher efficacy with the uh, Sputnik vaccine compared to uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, but then there are problems with manufacturing. So that was being discussed a lot, uh, that uh, because you have to develop two different vaccines. So the first dose of Sputnik is completely different from the second dose. So then you have to manufacture two different types of vaccines. And that is uh, difficult to do that in a pandemic situation where you have to make lots and lots of vaccines. Otherwise, it could be an ideal situation. Okay, good. Uh, next one is on, can antibody-mediated enhancement of the disease occur with whole cell vaccines? That's Yes, so, uh, so I think this is about what is seen with dengue, the antibody-dependent enhancement. So mm -hmm. uh, what happens is in dengue and so-called antibody-dependent enhancement, these uh, pre-existing antibodies uh, bind uh, to the virus and, may, and uh, facilitate it entry into certain immune cells like macrophages and facilitate infection. Now in COVID, uh, the main cells that are infected are not macrophages or these FC bearing cells, but S2 receptor bearing cells that are the respiratory epithelium and so on. So then they can't be infected by this AD mechanism. However, uh, 
there, there are a different type of antibodies in COVID, uh, which do enhance infection, uh, which, which are not through that mechanism. Okay, so it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's uh, two particular epitopes in this uh, spike protein, which have shown to enhance infection, but uh, by keeping the uh, spike protein confirmation open, I won't explain that, but there are enhancing antibodies uh, pre-existing, uh, and uh, but they have not shown to be enhanced through either inactivated vaccines or uh, the vector vaccines or the mRNA vaccines, but these enhancing antibodies are to a particular region of the spike protein. So it's not a dangerous uh, situation, unlike in uh, dengue, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yes. Good. Next one is actually directed to Dr. Uh, Harsha Satish Chandra. What is the analgesic that can be used after COVID vaccine uh, in a patient who is allergic to paracetamol? I think. Uh, well, I think probably Nilika will be a better place to answer that. Uh, uh, I will ask her because she's the person uh, who generally deals with these <laughs> complex issues. Yeah. Paracetamol. Okay. I think for most of the patients, probably don't need uh, that much of energy as well. I mean, they good hydration and that, that should sort things out. Nilika, you want to answer? Yeah, yeah I, I would agree. I mean, unless it's because it's not like a, it was a very few patients who developed very high fever and needed the energy, it's absolutely. So uh, if you're allergic to it, I think it's okay not to take it. But if you absolutely need it because of fever, which is our rivals, or which was a rare side effect reported, maybe you can take something like tramadol. I don't know what the, uh, Sandra would uh, say about that. Yeah. I mean, if you really need it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Other, other, other point is probably, uh, I mean, say if yeah. fever continues for more than 48 hours, I think we have to look, uh, look for other infections. So that's the other thing that presently now we, we are seeing a dengue epidemic as well. So I think we have to be careful, not put it down to the vaccine. It could be another infection that's developing. Yeah. That's right. So generally these side effects are, are not, uh, you know, uh, yes. uh, that require so much of interventions. They will go down with usual, uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, usual uh, treatment and so if it's severe I think definitely uh, this dengue is something that we need to consider yes. and they need to uh, seek medical attention yeah uh, yeah this one is uh, is it okay to get the second dose of AstraZeneca with a gap of six weeks while breastfeeding is the six weeks gap okay for the baby I think uh, yeah, so it, it, yes uh, so the it is nothing to do with the baby because it's the uh, the mother who is getting the vaccine and the vaccine uh, as we discussed, it's a, a non-replicating adenovirus, so uh, it is not going to be go to the baby. So a six week is, is completely fine uh, if you're breastfeeding or not breastfeeding, uh, but the 12 week uh, time period gives better efficacy than six weeks. But if you need to take it, six weeks is fine. Okay, yeah. Um, I think this is also probably if someone has taken Sputnik vaccine first dose, can he take the Chinese vaccine in a situation where the form is not available? So what is the gap? Yeah. Yes. So again, I think we have to wait. Uh, I, I think hopefully the Sputnik second dose will come for everybody who received the first dose. But if it doesn't, hopefully, uh, I, I believe the trial for single dose of Sputnik vaccine started early April. So by end of June, we would have data for efficacy, at least for 90-day efficacy. So I think we will have to wait for that data. Huh? Or I don't think you can just mix and match uh, Sputnik and Sinopharm without any data and decide on random uh, periods where you can give the second dose without uh, actually uh, looking at data. Yeah, so it, we might have even sufficient uh, neutralizing antibodies even with the one dose. Uh, we, we don't know. Yes, yes, we have to see. Yes. Yeah, we have to see. Uh, then uh, it is about a contraindication. Is vaccination contraindicated in patients with cardiomyopathy and now in intracardiac, now on intracardiac defibrillator? I think Dr. Satish would like to answer that. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, not, not really. I mean, like say patients who have uh, uh, comorbidities, especially uh, heart disease and diabetes, hypertension, obesity. I mean, they are the very people who need the vaccine. So uh, I think it's necessary to give. I, I can't, uh, I'm not aware of any contraindication. I think probably as Nilika would, uh, would agree, the only contraindications are for people who are allergic to vaccines. Uh, that's probably the absolute contraindication for, for vaccines. Is that right? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. I, I would like to clarify that actually. So when we say, so the contraindications are the allergy to the components of the vaccines because there's a lot of uh, confusion 
that if you have food allergy, if you have asthma, if you have allergic rhinitis, if you have chronic urticaria or any allergic condition that is a contraindication for a vaccine or a caution for a vaccine, the, uh, it is contraindicated in people who are allergic to the components of the vaccine and not the people who have some random uh, other random allergy. Okay, yeah. Uh, then uh, the next one is, what is the time period for PCR and rapid antigen test? I think probably this is maybe from the time of exposure, probably they are asking. Uh, uh, again, over to you, Nilika. Yeah, so, so after the time of exposure, uh, the, the median incubation period is around five. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, and the incubation period is start like from two to uh, 14 days. So uh, you can, if you are suspicious, you can do it around seven days or as soon as you develop symptoms, if you get symptoms uh, before that. Okay, right. Uh, next one is, I think, uh, what are the available COVID vaccines in Sri Lanka? You want to answer that question? Yeah, so we've got, uh, we have the COVID shield, hopefully we get more. We've got Sputnik, uh, uh, V and the Sinopharm. Uh, uh, other vaccines, uh, I think uh, Pfizer would come one of these days. Uh, yes, that, that, that's it. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think we are to get some, you know, Pfizer and so on, but we, they have not yet arrived. As yes. 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 What are the criteria to transfer the patients in between centers? Over to you, Harsha. Uh, um, but yeah, I think uh, that's an important question. Uh, I think one issue that uh, we have seen is that uh, while patients are being transferred, lots of uh, issues could happen. Now, let's say a patient who is uh, acutely short of breath, who's hypoxic and on, on oxygen. Uh, now, uh, we, and on high, maybe on a, on a high flow rate of oxygen as well. And uh, we know that in an ambulance, I mean, we can carry, uh, you know, a limited uh, 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 amount of oxygen. So if we anticipate that the transit is going to take, uh, take four hours or so, then probably, I mean, we would have to, uh, to uh, equip that ambulance with the necessary, uh, we'll have to make a calculation and see how, uh, how, how much of oxygen is needed. And let's say, I mean, if, uh, if the oxygen is going to run out in two hours while on trans, while on trans uh, that could be catastrophic. So uh, that is something that we have to uh, decide on. And I think uh, the important thing is, uh, the most important thing is, uh, the patient should be accompanied by a doctor. And I mean, say, if you take an intubated patient, um, I mean, the system, uh, the, the circuits are sealed. So the risk of aerosol generation is quite low. So a person wearing a full PPE, uh, staying in the compartment with the patient should be quite all right. Um, of course, if the patient is on NIV, there is a risk, but then I think uh, it's important that the doctor accompanies the patient. And uh, of course, there has to be, it has to be a prearranged transfer. Uh, the, the receiving center should know in advance that the patient is going to come so that they can make arrangements. Uh, so, uh, uh, I mean, uh, th there are some other minor details as well, which have been dealt by uh, uh, Ministry of Health circulars as well. So I think uh, we should refer to them. But the main thing is, I think uh, there have been instances when while on trans, unfortunately, uh, patients, uh, uh, once they get to the destination center, they are found to be quite, quite ill and some have actually not made it as well. Uh, so it's very important for us to make sure the patient is stable on trans and also to calculate the oxygen need. And I think, uh, and equip the ambulance with the necessary oxygen and maybe even other drugs, there can be a uh, there can be a uh, cardiovascular arrest while on transfer. So there should be uh, uh, the medical personnel as well as the equipment and the drugs to uh, treat an eventuality like that. Okay, thank you. Uh, there are some lots of more questions. I think we can, uh, all this now time is two o'clock. If with your permission, uh, can we uh, proceed to answer the questions that are there? Yeah, okay, right. yes. Okay. So next one is how do we tailor off dexamethasone after 10 days if and when if or when oxygen requirement is re reduced? Yeah. To, uh, uh, I mean, we, we do give dexamethasone for 10 days and then after that, uh, it will be a decision based on uh, the patient's clinical improvement and also uh, based, on, uh, based on the lung uh, uh, pathology as well. So sometimes x-rays or CT scans or say in a severely ill patient who has had, uh, I think I refer to this, uh, uh, an organizing pneumonia kind of thing in the second or the third week. Now that patient would need oral prednisolone as a follow-up course. So that will be continued for some time. 
with the regular clinic follow-up as well. So, and pulmonary rehabilitation, of course. So, uh, but in a patient who has recovered very well, I think uh, the standard uh, steroid dose is for that period. So we should be able to uh, uh, discontinue after that. Okay, yeah, good. Um, then again, another question on admission criteria. Probably. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, once a patient uh, tests positive, uh, either through PCR or through antigen, then uh, uh, the lab would inform uh, the uh, epidemiology unit. And then, of course, through the, PHI, the, the, through the PHI, the patient will be informed. The patient also has a responsibility to inform the PHI uh, of the area. And then, I mean, Sri Lanka still adopts a policy of uh, uh, isolating these patients at centers of, of uh, at various levels. There, there are intermediate centers, then uh, what you call uh, category two hospitals, and then also uh, specialized centers. So depending on the patient's, uh, patient's uh, uh, severity of illness at the time of diagnosis, the patient would be transferred out. Uh, there is a pilot project going on, I think in the Kaltara district where uh, patients who are at home until they have been transferred out, until there are vacancies in other hospitals, until they are transferred out, they are monitored at home. So that is in those patients, uh, probably uh, an important thing would be uh, now these patients are monitored. So there will be field uh, uh, medical teams, PHIs, MOH monitoring them. So if they do develop uh, desaturation, then these patients have to be transferred out. Then any patient who presents to uh, uh, to a uh, I mean to a hospital uh, uh, at whatever level uh, will be investigated for shortness of breath. And of course, once they are found to be positive, then they are treated given the appropriate treatment according to the guidelines. And uh, I think we find that uh, although there are uh, many uh, sentinel center, what we call sentinel sentinel hospitals. Uh, dealing with COVID now, actually those have become uh, treatment centers as well because there is a large number occupying uh, COVID centers. So they are being treated at those places. So admission, I mean, I, I think probably uh, what they mean by admission, what is meant by the admission criteria. I mean, any patient uh, who is uh, positive at the moment he is uh, admitted to a, to a facility and the patient is monitored and uh, especially uh, the patient has been monitored for development of hypoxia, which generally happens after day five of, uh, of the uh, initial uh, onset of symptoms. But of course, the patient may have had the PCR a little later, maybe on day three or four. So it could follow in the, in the next couple of days, the patient may uh, desaturate. So that's important uh, for monitoring. Okay, thank you. I think that, that's clear, that's good. Uh, the next question is to, uh, directed to Neelika. Uh, can you comment on the thrombocytopenic thrombosis with AstraZeneca vaccine, especially in the young? So actually this uh, vaccine induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia, VIIT, and of course, of course different names, is seen following the adenovirus vector vaccines like AstraZeneca and also the Johnson & Johnson. Uh, and it is uh, shown, to be of a, uh, shown to occur in younger people in most of the time, but also has been reported in older people as well and is uh, shown to occur because of antibodies to the platelet activate uh, PO4, platelet factor 4, uh, PFO. Uh, the mechanisms why this happens, nobody knows whether it's because of the adenovirus factor, whether there is some differences in the spike protein or genetic factors. Uh, but it is mainly seen after the first dose. Uh, the incidence after the second dose is very, very less. So uh, with the first dose, it varies from uh, 1 in 150,000 to 1 in 250,000. Uh, and after the second dose, the incidence is from one in uh, one million. So the incidence is very much lower after the second dose. So uh, if it's immune mediated, why it doesn't happen during this, when the second dose is also given is, is a little bit of a question. So actually right now, uh, these PFO, anti-PFO antibodies have been identified in such people, but the pathogenesis is still not very clear. Okay, right. Uh, next one again, question is not very clear. What would be the factors to consider in a patient if a patient is immunocompromised, just diabetes and old age, etc.? Probably this is regarding vaccination. Uh, the question is asked. So, uh, again, yes, no I, I, yeah. yeah, so, so uh, if somebody is immunosuppressed because of old age, I don't know, old age per se is not immunosuppression, but let's say if somebody is on immunosuppressive drugs, 
uh, any vaccine, any of the current registered vaccines are fine, the mRNA vaccines, the adenoviral vector vaccines, or the inactivated vaccines, because the uh, adenovirus vaccines are also not replicating uh, vaccines. But with any vaccine, the immune response is less in immunosuppressed individuals. Uh, but having said that, uh, with any vaccine, although the immunogenicity is far less than immunocompetent people, it, is, it still makes sense to uh, immunize them uh, because they would develop some immunity, although not very high levels of neutralizing antibodies. Uh, maybe they develop some T-cell immunity, some mucosal immunity. There are so many other types of immunity as well, which are not measurable. So it is important to vaccinate individuals because it's immunosuppressed people who are more prone to develop severe COVID. Okay, I think that's very good uh, piece of advice. Can STEMI patients who are on aspirin get vaccinated? Probably because of antiplatelet effect. Uh, yeah. 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 I don't think uh, that there is an issue uh, of contraindications as such. Yes, that's thing. I think there are guidelines issued uh, on that. Uh, you know, the, the those who are on antiplatelets can get vaccinated without any. Probably the, the issue is about development of hematoma, uh, uh, hematoma and so on. I think there is no recommendation to stop uh, the, those uh, drugs, uh, those who are on antiplatelets, but to go and get the vaccine, yes. Uh, next one, uh, patients who are on methotrexate or any other immunosuppressant, is it necessary to stop these medications for a short period after COVID vaccination to facilitate development of neutralizing antibodies? So, uh, of course, uh, these depend on what condition the person is has to be on these uh, drugs in the first place, uh, whether uh, stopping them can uh, cause huge problem, like if it's a renal you know, transplant patient, uh, it doesn't make any sense to stop the drugs at all. But, uh, and, but let's say it's a patient with, I don't know, rheumatoid arthritis who taking off uh, the drugs for one week doesn't make a huge difference, then maybe stopping the drugs for one week uh, Again, there are no trials to say if it's stopping for one week enhances immunity or not. But I mean, that could be tried if it is feasible to stop. But in most instances, I think uh, people can't stop uh, these drugs. So it depends on the cause, uh, the indication of these drugs. And of course, just stopping for one week, uh, there is no evidence to show that stop, uh, stopping for one week versus whether, because these drugs have a very long uh, immune suppressive effect, usually. Uh, so just stopping for one week might not just uh, bring your immune response back to the normal level. Yeah, I think uh, those patients who are on immunosuppressants, uh, no uh, recommendation is made to either reduce or stop because I think yes. we don't have evidence and I think yes. they are expected to take the vaccine while on the medications because yes. reducing the dose also can result in exacerbation of the illness as well. So I think, yeah. Uh, next one, what about getting the second dose of vaccine when the person gets infected with the with COVID-19 before the second dose? Yes, so, so there have been lots of instances right now, uh, yeah. even, <laughs> even in the, we are, see, we are seeing after the first dose of COVID shield, so many people have got infected, and after the first dose of Sinopharm in Sri Lanka, every day so many people have got infected. Uh, so the recommendations of the CDC and, and other authorities is to go and get the second dose four weeks after recovery. Four weeks after recovery, okay. Yeah. Right, good. Uh, what vaccines are suitable for immunocompromised patients, whether there are any particular vaccines that are recommended for immunocom uh, immunocompromised patients? Yeah. Uh, there is no uh, such vaccine, but because all vaccines are less uh, immunogenic in uh, immunocompromised patients, if I have a choice, this is mm -hmm. if you do have a choice, I would go for a vaccine which induces higher, which is most immunogenic. Like, uh, so for instance, I just showed you the graph, the Pfizer and Moderna actually are the ones that induce the highest amount of neutralizing antibodies. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so I would go for something like that in immunosuppressed people rather than a vaccine that induces lower neutralizing antibodies, if there was a choice. The choice, yes. <laughs> right. Then uh, again, what are the vaccines which are safe during pregnancy? Uh, so I think that Sinopharm uh, is, is being uh, given in a triage basis uh, to uh, pregnant females in Sri Lanka. This is because of the devastation, uh, because COVID in pregnancy uh, is associated with higher morbidity and mortality. Uh, but even other vaccines were given, uh, the, the mRNA and the AstraZeneca vaccine was given to pregnant mothers in other countries, especially when the risk of getting COVID 
outweighs any uh, uh, risk of uh, associated with the vaccine itself. So healthcare workers in other countries who have a very high risk of uh, being exposed to COVID were given all these different types of vaccines. Uh, next one is again related to pregnancy. Is there a time duration to getting pregnant after taking the second dose of AstraZeneca? And you can get pregnant the next day. There is no issue. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, next one is on again anticoagulants. Well, what about patients who are on warfarin? Can they get the vaccine? And if so, any precautions uh, for them? Dr. Sassis can answer that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah, probably we will have to uh, know the INR value as well in these patients. Some of these patients probably, I mean, they have a very high INR, high INR level because some of them are not monitored very regularly. So in that case, we, we may have to defer vaccination in them. So it's an uh, individual decision. I think uh, you can't sort of give a blanket decision for that. Uh, but of course, I mean, those patients who are on warfarin are probably patients with comorbidities and so they are the, the very ones who need the vaccine as well. So we, we should, uh, uh, at the earliest uh, opportunity, uh, we should be able to give the vaccine. I think it's probably, it's not going to be a, a big issue if the INR is within th therapeutic limits uh, to, to give the vaccine. Yeah, I think there was the guideline said that to do an INR and if it is yes. less than three, they can be given the vaccine. Yeah. But of course, to have more uh, pressure on that point of administration uh, after the vaccine. That's, I think, what the guidelines said. Yes. Uh, it would. Uh, what are the side effects? Why are there side effects on all vaccination, uh, vaccination events while natural infections uh, can be asymptomatic? So, 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 yes, yeah, yes. Uh, so, so natural infection is asymptomatic in the majority. Even uh, whatever variant, I don't know the, the proportion of asymptomatic individuals could fall with the uh, certain variants. Uh, and even with vaccination, there are enough people who have no side effects at all. Uh, so, uh, and uh, a little bit of aches and pains here and there. The thing is, like, if we look about, uh, think about asymptomatic infection. Some days we might feel a little bit of uh, aches and pains and we might not think that we got infected at all. So whereas after the vaccine, you're actively thinking, am I feeling okay and, and things? So that is also one difference. I think the majority of people who got vaccines uh, did not develop much symptoms at all. I know some people did uh, with the COVID shield. They got fever, chills and rigors and, and, and everything, but most people didn't. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So it just, you know, there's wide variation in the symptoms, uh, even yes. with the vaccine, similar to, I yes. think, COVID. Yes. Yes. Uh, again, the other one is also related to birth defects. Is there any uh, known, uh, uh, is AstraZeneca vaccine known to cause birth defects if it is taken during embryogenesis? Uh, it, 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 there are no such uh, birth defects recorded. And actually, as mentioned, this is a non-replicating virus. So because it's a non-replicating virus, uh, it is uh, not possible for it to cross the placenta and go and infect uh, uh, the fetus and cause uh, birth defects. Uh, because the, the viruses that cause birth defects actively replicate in the, in the fetus. And uh, it doesn't replicate in the uh, vaccine or the fetus. So it, it is uh, very uh, unlikely or impossible to fight to cause birth defects. Okay, good. Uh, next is... Uh, uh... With current evidence, is Sinopharm vaccine superior to AstraZeneca? And if so, in what ways, considering the side effect profile? Uh, so uh, it, it is difficult to say what is superior and what is <laughs> it, it's difficult to do direct comparisons of vaccines because, um, as I uh, said, uh, when, when these clinical trials were done, uh, the efficacy rates dependent on the uh, prevalence of, of uh, SARS CoV 2. Uh, during that time period, and also the variant that was circulating, and so many, and what was actually measured. So, uh, for AstraZeneca, we know that uh, when it takes severe disease, and in their trials, nobody got severe disease or died, uh, people who got the AstraZeneca vaccine. In the Sinopharm vaccine, uh, two people in the placebo arm got severe disease, and nobody in the, but, but again, it was not covered. So, we can't, it's difficult to do direct comparisons between vaccines as such. And uh, side effects wise, uh, I mean, we know that these rare side effects of thrombosis does occur with uh, uh, the AstraZeneca. Uh, so, uh, and uh, this is because it was rolled out in such a large number of countries uh, in, in Europe, 
which we're recording this. So we, I think it's important to, uh, so I don't know about the Sinopharm side effects. They don't seem to be uh, too bad, but I think we need to uh, do uh, active surveillance of all the side effects of all the vaccines currently in use. Okay, yeah. Uh, next one is on uh, uh, our uh, data. Uh, do we have uh, vaccine-related thrombosis data on uh, vaccine-related thrombosis in uh, from our country, from Sri Lanka? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the vaccine-induced thrombosis data is recorded uh, at the epidemiology unit. Okay. They are collected by the epidemiology unit, isn't it? Yes. 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 Then uh, this one again, Nilika can answer. If the patient develops an anaphylaxis after the first dose of AstraZeneca, can a different vaccine be given? I think that's a uh, you know, good question. Yes, yes. So, I mean, if you develop anaphylaxis after the first dose of AstraZeneca, you wouldn't be giving uh, it again, but you can give Sinopharm or some other vaccines because the con contents, uh, the composition or the ingredients of Sinopharm are very different to uh, that of AstraZeneca. Okay, right, good. Uh, then I think we are coming probably to the last question. How long should a patient isolate after discharge from hospital? Does the time duration depend on when the PCR was done or the start of symptoms? Yeah, so uh, the PCR, yeah. Okay. So the, wait, wait. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. yes. <laughs> so then, then he can, maybe he can answer. Yes, yes, please go ahead. No, no, yeah. no, no, okay. no I, think, I, I think it's a good question for here. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, I mean, it depends. Now, say uh, uh, if a patient, uh, now, well, in a symptomatic patient, uh, we uh, the discharge criteria, the main criteria is that uh, the patient now has to be uh, now from day one onwards, uh, the days are counted. And then if the patient has been asymptomatic for the last three days, and if 10 days have uh, lapsed from the first day of symptoms, then that patient is fit for discharge. And we would have want the patient to isolate for another four days to complete 14 days at home. Uh, so four days at home and, and the 10 days in hospital. In asymptomatic patients, we do not have, uh, uh, have you know, the, uh, the knowledge when the patient uh, first acquired the virus. So we would go take the first day of PCR. So uh, if the, pa when the patient is discharged, if the patient does not have symptoms uh, uh, by day 10, and again, the patient is asked to isolate for four more days at home. So the complete uh, uh, the duration is 14 days. So, uh, and of course, uh, uh, so it depends on whether the patient developed uh, symptoms or not. Okay, good. Nilika, you want to, why don't you also, uh, you know, add uh, to that question? No, no, yes? I, I, no I, I think that's, that's fine, yes. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, then this one, I think uh, there are some more questions coming actually. Uh, why is the reactogenicity uh, of the AstraZeneca vaccine lower than in the old age group? Nilika? Uh, yes, so, so actually the reactogenicity depends on the initial innate immune response to the virus. Uh, so uh, we know that uh, so, and there's a huge individual variation. So studies have not shown that people who develop a better reactogenicity or, or react more to the vaccine develop a better immune response in, in young individuals. Uh, so uh, it's, it's just that pe younger people tend to recognize these so-called so danger signals better and uh, react in an aggressive manner, possibly. Okay, right, good. I think this is another question that we uh, probably Nilaka can. Uh, that's the last one, I think, as of now. What is the analgesic can? Uh, what is the analgesic analgesic that can be given to a person who are uh, who is allergic to paracetamol after vaccination? I think we took yeah. that. We took the question. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I think that's it. So <laughs> we have uh, spent another twenty more minutes uh, in answering questions. I think we had a long list of questions. And I'm happy that uh, you know both of you agreed to stay on to answer all the questions. I think it, we had a very successful uh, 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 program where we I noted that there were over 270 um, participants in in uh, in a Zoom forum. I think, and there were a lot more over the. Uh, 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 SLMA Facebook page as well. Uh, and it is my pleasure to uh, thank both uh, Professor Nilika Malaviki and Dr. Harsha Satish Chandra for um, doing excellent presentations, uh, you know, uh, doing uh, more than justice to both your topics and also answering all the questions that were uh, sent um, 
to uh, uh, send uh, you know by the uh, participants we had a lot of questions i think both of you were able to um, address all their concerns and doubts uh, satisfactorily so i think they would be quite happy uh, about that and i wish to thank the slma as well as the secretary of the uh, medicinal drugs committee professor pradeepa jayawardena who did the groundwork uh, behind the scenes uh, to uh, make this uh, therapeutic update possible and also Uh, the SLMA uh, IT committee uh, coordinator Vihanga, uh, who helped with uh, the IT. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Pirashan. Thank you, Nidhika. Thank you.